This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2. Chapter 33. The Grave Song. Yonder is the grave island, the silent isle. Yonder also are the graves of my youth. Thither will I carry an evergreen wreath of life. Resolving thus in my heart did I sail o'er the sea. O oh, ye sights and scenes of my youth! O oh, all ye gleams of love, ye divine fleeting gleams! How could ye perish so soon for me? Think of you to-day as my dead ones. From you, my dearest dead ones, cometh unto me a sweet savour, heart-opening and melting. Verily it convulseth and openeth the heart of the lone seafarer. Still am I the richest and most to be envied, I the lonesomest one, for I have possessed you, and ye possess me still. Tell me, to whom hath there ever fallen such rosy apples from the tree as have fallen unto me? Still am I your love's heir and heritage, blooming to your memory with many hued, wild, growing virtues, O ye dearest ones. Ah, we were made to remain nigh unto each other, ye kindly, strange marvels, and not like timid birds did ye come to me in my longing, nay, but as trusting ones to a trusting one. Yea, made for faithfulness like me, and for fond eternities, must I now name you by your faithlessness, ye divine glances and fleeting gleams. No other name have I yet learnt. Verily too early did ye die for me, ye fugitives. Yet did ye not flee from me, nor did I flee from you. Innocent are we to each other in our faithlessness. To kill me did they strangle you, ye singing birds of my hopes. Yea, at you, ye dearest ones, did malice ever shoot its arrows, to hit my heart. And they hit it, because ye were always my dearest, my possession and my possessedness. On that account had ye to die young and far too early. At my most vulnerable point did they shoot the arrow, namely at you whose skin is like down, or more like the smile that dieth at a glance. But this word will I say unto mine enemies, What is all manslaughter in comparison with what ye have done unto me? Worse evil did ye do unto me than all manslaughter, the irretrievable did ye take from me. Thus do I speak unto you, mine enemies. Slew ye not my youth's vision and dearest marvels? My playmates took ye from me, the blessed spirits. To their memory do I deposit this wreath and this curse, this curse upon you, mine enemies. Have ye not made mine eternal short as a tone dieth away in a cold night? Scarcely as the twinkle of divine eyes did it come to me as a fleeting gleam. Thus spake once in a happy hour my purity. Divine shall everything be unto me. Then did ye haunt me with foul phantoms. Ah, whither hath that happy hour now fled? All days shall be holy unto me, so spake once the wisdom of my youth. Verily the language of a joyous wisdom. But then did ye enemies steal my nights, and sold them to sleepless torture. Ah, whither hath that joyous wisdom now fled? Once did I long for happy auspices. Then did ye lead an owl monster across my path, an adverse sight. Ah, whither did my tender longing then flee? All loathing did I once vow to renounce. Then did ye change my nigh ones and nearest ones into ulcerations. Ah, whither did my noblest vow then flee? As a blind one did I once walk in blessed ways. Then did ye cast filth on the blind one's course and now he is disgusted with the old footpath. When I performed my hardest task, and celebrated the triumph of my victories, then did ye make those who loved me call out that I then grieved them the most. Verily it was always your doing, ye embittered to me my best honey and the diligence of my best bees. 
to my charity have ye ever sent the most impudent beggars. Around my sympathy have ye ever crowded the incurably shameless. Thus have ye wounded the faith of my virtue. And when I offered my holiest as a sacrifice, immediately did your piety put its fatter gifts beside it, so that my holiest suffocated in the fumes of your fat. And once did I want to dance as I had never yet danced. Beyond all heavens did I want to dance. Then did ye seduce my favorite minstrel. And now hath he struck up an awful melancholy air. Alas, he tooted as a mournful horn to mine ear. Murderous minstrel, instrument of evil, most innocent instrument! Already did I stand prepared for the best dance. Then didst thou slay my rapture with thy tones. Only in the dance do I know how to speak the parable of the highest things. And now hath my grandest parable remained unspoken in my limbs. Unspoken and unrealized hath my highest hope remained. And there have perished for me all the visions and consolations of my youth. How did I ever bear it? How did I survive and surmount such wounds? How did my soul rise again out of those sepulchres? Yea, something invulnerable, unburyable is with me, something that would rend rocks asunder. It is called my will. Silently doth it proceed, and unchanged throughout the years. Its course will it go upon my feet, mine old will. Hard of heart is the nature, and invulnerable. Invulnerable am I only in my heel. Ever livest thou there, and art like thyself, thou most patient one. Ever hast thou burst all shackles of the tomb. In thee still livest also the unrealizedness of my youth. And as life and youth sittest thou here hopeful on the yellow ruins of graves. Yea, thou art still for me the demolisher of all graves. Hail to thee my will, and only where there are graves are there resurrections. Thus sang Zarathustra. End of chapter 33 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 2 Chapter 34 Self-Surpassing Will to truth do ye call it, ye wisest ones, that which impelleth you and maketh you ardent, will for the thinkableness of all being, thus do I call your will. All being would ye make thinkable, for ye doubt with good reason whether it be already thinkable. But it shall accommodate and bend itself to you, so willeth your will. Smooth shall it become and subject to the spirit, as its mirror and reflection. That is your entire will, ye wisest ones, as a will to power. And even when ye speak of good and evil, and of estimates of value, ye would still create a world before which ye can bow the knee, such as your ultimate hope and ecstasy. The ignorant, to be sure, the people, they are like a river on which a boat floateth long, and in the boat sits the estimates of value, solemn and disguised. Your will and your valuations have put ye on the river of becoming. It betrayeth unto me an old will to power, what is believed by the people as good and evil. It was ye, ye wisest ones, who put such guests in this boat, and gave them pomp and proud names ye in your ruling will. Onward the river now carrieth your boat, it must carry it. A small matter if the rough wave foameth and angrily resisteth its keel. It is not the river that is your danger and the end of your good and evil, ye wisest ones, but that will itself, the will to power, the unexhausted procreating life will. But that ye may understand my gospel of good and evil, for that purpose will I tell you my gospel of life, and of the nature of all living things. The living thing did I follow. I walked in the broadest and narrowest paths to learn its nature. 
With a hundred-faced mirror did I catch its glance when its mouth was shut, so that its eye might speak unto me, and its eye spake unto me. But wherever I found living things, there heard I also the language of obedience. All living things are obeying things. And this I heard secondly. Whatever cannot obey itself is commanded. Such is the nature of living things. This, however, is the third thing which I heard, namely that commanding is more difficult than obeying. And not only because the commander beareth the burden of all obeyers, and because this burden readily crusheth him. An attempt and a risk seemed all commanding unto me, and whenever it commandeth, the living thing risketh itself thereby. Yea, even when it commandeth itself, then also must it atone for its commanding. Of its own law must it become the judge and avenger and victim. How doth this happen? So did I ask myself. What persuadeth the living thing to obey and command and even be obedient in commanding? Hearken now unto my word, ye wisest ones. Test it seriously, whether I have crept into the heart of life itself and into the roots of its heart. Wherever I found a living thing, there found I will to power, and even in the will of the servant found I the will to be master. That to the stronger the weaker shall serve, thereto persuadeth he his will who would be master over a still weaker one. That delight alone he is unwilling to forego. And as the lesser surrender himself to the greater, that he may have delight and power over the least of all, so doth even the greatest surrender himself, and staketh life for the sake of power. It is the surrender of the greatest to run risk and danger, and play dice for death. And where there is sacrifice, and service, and love glances, there also is the will to be master. By byways doth the weaker then slink into the fortress, and into the heart of the mightier one, and there stealeth power. And this secret spake life herself unto me. Behold, said she, I am that which must ever surpass itself. To be sure, ye call it will to procreation, or impulse towards a goal, towards the higher, remoter, and more manifold. But all that is one and the same secret. Rather would I succumb than disown this one thing. And verily, where there is succumbing and leaf falling, lo, there doth life sacrifice itself for power. That I have to be struggle and becoming and purpose and cross purpose. Ah, he who divineth my will divineth well also on what crooked paths it hath to tread. Whatever I create and however much I love it, soon must I be adverse to it and to my love so willeth my will. And even thou, discerning one, art only a path and footstep of my will. Verily my will to power walketh even in the feet of thy will to truth. He certainly did not hit the truth who shot at it the formula, will to existence, that will doth not exist. For what is not cannot will, that, however, which is in existence, how could it still strive for existence? Only where there is life is there also will. Not, however, will to life, but, so teach I thee, will to power. Much is reckoned higher than life itself by the living one. But out of the very reckoning speaketh the will to power. Thus did life once teach me. And thereby, ye wisest ones, do I solve you the riddle of your hearts. Verily, I say unto you, Good and evil, which would be everlasting, it doth not exist. Of its own accord must it ever surpass itself anew. With your values and formulae of good and evil, ye exercise power, ye valuing ones. And that is your secret love and the sparkling, trembling, and overflowing of your souls. But a stronger power groweth out of your values, and a new surpassing, by it breaketh egg and eggshell. And he who hath to be a creator in good and evil, 
Verily, he hath first to be a destroyer, and break values in pieces. Thus doth the greatest evil pertain to the greatest good. That, however, is the creating good. Let us speak thereof, ye wisest ones, even though it be bad. To be silent is worse. All suppressed truths become poisonous. And let everything break up which can break up by our truths. Many a house is still to be built. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 34This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Duckweiler. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 2, Chapter 35, The Sublime Ones Calm is the bottom of my sea. Who would guess that it hideth troll monsters? Unmoved is my depth, but it sparkleth with swimming enigmas and laughters. A sublime one saw I to-day, a solemn one, a penitent of the spirit. Oh, how my soul laughed at his ugliness! With upraised breast, and like those who draw in their breath, thus did he stand, the sublime one, and in silence. O'erhung with ugly truths, the spoil of his hunting, and rich in torn raiment. Many thorns also hung on him, but I saw no rose. Not yet had he learned laughing and beauty, Gloomy did this hunter return from the forest of knowledge. From the fight with wild beasts returned he home. But even yet a wild beast gazeth out of his seriousness, an unconquered wild beast. As a tiger doth ever he stand on the point of springing. But I do not like those strained souls. Ungracious is my taste towards all those self-engrossed ones. And ye tell me, friends, that there is to be no dispute about taste and tasting. But all life is a dispute about taste and tasting. Taste, that is weight at the same time, and scales and wear, and alas for every living thing that would live without dispute about weight and scales and wear. Should he become weary of his sublimeness, this sublime one, then only will his beauty begin and then only will I taste him and find him savoury. And only when he turneth away from himself will he o'erlap his own shadow, and verily into his sun. Far too long did he sit in the shade, the cheeks of the penitent of the spirit become pale. He almost starved on his expectations. Contempt is still in his eye, and loathing hideth in his mouth. To be sure he now resteth, but he hath not yet taken rest in the sunshine. As the ox ought he to do, and his happiness should smell of the earth, and not of contempt for the earth. As a white ox would I like to see him, which, snorting and lowing, walketh before the plowshare, and his lowing should also laud all that is earthly. Dark still is his countenance, the shadow of his hand danceth upon it. O'ershadowed is still the sense of his eye. His deed itself is still the shadow upon him. His doing obscureth the doer. Not yet hath he overcome his deed. To be sure I love him in the shoulders of the ox, but now do I want to see also the eye of the angel. Also his hero will hath he still to unlearn. An exalted one shall he be, and not only a sublime one. The ether itself should raise him, the willless one. He hath subdued monsters, he hath solved enigmas. But he should also redeem his monsters and enigmas. Into heavenly children should he transform them. As yet hath his knowledge not learned to smile, and to be without jealousy. As yet hath his gushing passion not become calm in beauty. Verily not in satiety shall his longing cease and disappear, but in beauty. Gracefulness belongeth to the munificence of the magnanimous. His arm across his head. Thus should the hearer repose. Thus should he also surmount his repose. But precisely to the hero is beauty the hardest thing of all. 
unattainable is beauty by all ardent wills. A little more, a little less, precisely this is much here, it is the most here. To stand with relaxed muscles and with unharnessed will, that is the hardest for all of you, ye sublime ones. When power becometh gracious and descendeth into the visible, I call such condescension beauty. And from no one do I want beauty so much as from thee, thou powerful one. Let thy goodness be thy last self-conquest. All evil do I credit to thee, therefore do I desire of thee the good. Verily, I have often laughed at the weaklings, who think themselves good because they have crippled paws. The virtue of the pillar shalt thou strive after. More beautiful doth it ever become, and more graceful, but internally harder and more sustaining, the higher it riseth. Yea, thou sublime one, one day shalt thou also be beautiful, and hold up to the mirror thine own beauty. Then will thy soul thrill with divine desires, and there will be adoration even in thy vanity. For this is the secret of the soul. When the hero hath abandoned it, then only approacheth it in dreams, the superhero. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 35 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common, Part 3, Chapter 36, The Land of Culture. Too far did I fly into the future. A horror seized upon me. And when I looked around me, lo, there time was my sole contemporary. Then did I fly backwards, homewards, and always faster. Thus did I come unto you, ye present-day men, and into the land of culture. For the first time brought I and I to see you, and good desire, verily with longing in my heart did I come. But how did it turn out with me? Although so alarmed, I had yet to laugh. Never did mine eye see anything so motley colored. I laughed and laughed while my foot still trembled, and my heart as well. Here, forsooth, is the home of all the paint-pots, said I. With fifty patches painted on faces and limbs, so sat ye there to mine astonishment, ye present-day men. And with fifty mirrors around you, which flattered your play of colors, and repeated it. Verily ye could wear no better masks, ye present-day men, than your own faces. Who could recognize you? written all over with the characters of the past, and these characters also penciled over with new characters. Thus have ye concealed yourselves well from all decipherers. And though one be a trier of the reins, who still believeth that ye have reins, out of colors ye seem to be baked, and out of glued scraps. All times and people gaze divers colored out of your veils. All customs and beliefs speak divers colored out of your gestures. He who would strip you of veils and wrappers and paints and gestures would just have enough left to scare the crows. Verily I myself and the sacred crow that once saw you naked and without paint, and I flew away when the skeleton ogled at me. Rather would I be a day laborer in the nether world and among the shades of the bygone. Fatter and fuller than ye are forsooth the nether worldlings. This, yea, this is bitterness to my bowels, that I can neither endure you naked nor clothed, ye present day men. All that is unhomelike in the future, and whatever maketh strayed birds shiver, is verily more homelike and familiar than your reality. For thus speak ye. Real are we holy, and without faith and superstition. Thus do ye plume yourselves, alas, even without plumes. Indeed, how would ye be able to believe, ye diverse-colored ones, ye who are pictures of all that hath ever been believed? Perambulating refutations are ye, of belief itself, and a dislocation of all thought, 
untrustworthy ones, thus do I call you, ye real ones. All periods prayed against one another in your spirits, and the dreams and pratings of all periods were even realer than your awakeness. Unfruitful are ye, therefore do ye lack belief. But he who had to create had always his presaging dreams and astral premonitions, and believed in believing. Half-open doors are ye, at which grave-diggers wait, and this is your reality. Everything deserveth to perish. Alas, how ye stand there before me, ye unfruitful ones! How lean your ribs! And many of you surely have had knowledge thereof. Many a one hath said, There hath surely a god filched something from me secretly whilst I slept. Fairly enough to make a girl for himself therefrom. Amazing is the poverty of my ribs. Thus hath spoken many a present-day man. Yea, ye are laughable unto me, ye present-day men, and especially when ye marvel at yourselves. And woe unto me if I could not laugh at your marveling, and had to swallow all that is repugnant in your platters. As it is, however, I will make lighter of you, since I have to carry what is heavy, and what matter, if beetles and maybugs also alight on my load. Verily it shall not on that account become heavier to me, and not from you, ye present-day men, shall my great weariness arise. Ah, uh, whither shall I now ascend with my longing? From all mountains do I look out for fatherlands and motherlands. But a home have I found nowhere. Unsettled am I in all cities, and decamping at all gates. Alien to me and a mockery are the present-day men, to whom of late my heart impelled me, and exiled am I from fatherlands and motherlands. Thus do I love only my children's land, the undiscovered in the remotest sea, for it do I bid my sails search and search. Unto my children will I make amends for being the child of my fathers, and unto all the future for this present day. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 36 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2. Chapter 37. Immaculate Perception. When yester eve the moon arose, then did I fancy it about to bear a sun. So broad and teeming did it lie on the horizon. But it was a liar with its pregnancy and sooner will I believe in the man in the moon than in the woman. To be sure, little of a man is he also, that timid night reveller. Verily with a bad conscience doth he stalk over the roofs. For he is covetous and jealous, the monk in the moon, covetous of the earth and all the joys of lovers. Nay, I like him not, that tomcat of the roofs, hateful unto me are all that slink around half-closed windows. Piously and silently doth he stalk along the star carpets, but I like no light treading human feet on which not even a spur jingleth. Every honest one's step speaketh. The cat, however, stealeth along over the ground. Lo, cat-like, doth the moon come along and dishonestly. This parable speak I unto you, sentimental dissemblers, unto you, the pure discerners, you do I call covetous ones. Also ye love the earth and the earthly, I have divined you well, but shame is in your love, and a bad conscience, ye are like the moon. To despise the earthly hath your spirit been persuaded, but not your bowels, these, however, are the strongest in you. And now is your spirit ashamed to be at the service of your bowels, and goeth by ways and lying ways to escape its own shame. That would be the highest thing for me, so saith your lying spirit unto itself, to gaze upon life without desire, and not like the dog with hanging out tongue, to be happy in gazing, 
with dead will, free from the grip and greed of selfishness, cold and ashy gray all over, but with intoxicated moon eyes. That would be the dearest thing to me. Thus doth the seduced one seduce himself. To love the earth as the moon loveth it, and with the eye only to feel its beauty. And this do I call immaculate perception of all things, to want nothing else from them but to be allowed to lie before them as a mirror with a hundred facets. O oh, ye sentimental dissemblers, ye covetous ones, ye lack innocence in your desire, and now do ye defame desiring on that account. Verily not as creators, as procreators, or as jubilators do ye love the earth. Where is innocence? where there is will to procreation. And he who seeketh to create beyond himself hath for me the purest will. Where is beauty? Where I must will with my whole will, where I will love and perish, that an image may not remain merely an image. Loving and perishing, these have rhymed for eternity. Will to love, that is to be ready also for death. Thus do I speak unto you cowards, but now doth your emasculated ogling profess to be contemplation, and that which can be examined with cowardly eyes is to be christened beautiful. O oh, ye violators of noble names! But it shall be your curse, ye immaculate ones, ye pure discerners, that ye shall never bring forth, even though ye lie broad and teeming on the horizon. Verily ye fill your mouth with noble words, and we are to believe that your heart overfloweth, ye cousiners. But my words are poor, contemptible, stammering words. Gladly do I pick up what falleth from the table at your repasts. Yet still can I say therewith the truth to dissemblers. Yea, my fish-bone shells and prickly leaves shall tickle the noses of dissemblers. Bad air is always about you and your repasts. Your lascivious thoughts, your lies and secrets are indeed in the air. Dare only to believe in yourselves, in yourselves, and in your inward parts. He who doth not believe in himself always lieth. A god's mask have ye hung in front of you, ye pure ones. Into a god's mask hath your execrable coiling snake crawled. Verily ye deceive ye contemplative ones. Even Zarathustra was once the dupe of your godlike exterior. He did not divine the serpent's coil with which it was stuffed. A god's soul, I once thought I saw playing in your games, ye pure discerners. No better arts did I once dream of than your arts. Serpent's filth and evil odor, the distance concealed from me, and that a lizard's craft prowled thereabouts lasciviously. But I came nigh unto you, then came to me the day, and now cometh it to you, at the end is the moon's love affair. See there, surprised and pale doth it stand before the rosy dawn. For already she cometh, the glowing one, her love to the earth cometh. Innocence and creative desire is all solar love. See there how she cometh impatiently over the sea. Do ye not feel the thirst and the hot breath of her love? At the sea would she suck and drink its depths to her height. Now riseth the desire of the sea with its thousand breasts. Kissed and sucked would it be by the thirst of the sun. Vapor would it become in height and path of light and light itself. Verily like the sun do I love life in all deep seas. And this meaneth to me knowledge. All that is deep shall ascend to my height. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 37 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. Thus spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2, chapter 38. Scholars. When I lay asleep... Then did a sheep eat at the ivy wreath on my head. It ate and said thereby, Zarathustra is no longer a scholar. It said this and went away clumsily and proudly. A child told it to me. I like to lie here where the children play, beside the ruined wall, among thistles and red poppies. 
A scholar am I still to the children, and also to the thistles and red poppies. Innocent are they even in their wickedness. But to the sheep I am no longer a scholar. So willeth my lot, blessings upon it. For this is the truth, I have departed from the house of the scholars, and the door have I also slammed behind me. Too long did my soul sit hungry at their table. Not like them have I got the knack of investigating as the knack of nut cracking. Freedom do I love, and the air over fresh soil. Rather would I sleep on ox skins than on their honors and dignities. I am too hot and scorched with mine own thought. Often is it ready to take away my breath. Then have I to go into the open air, and away from all dusty rooms. But they sit cool in the cool shade. They want in everything to be merely spectators, and they avoid sitting where the sun burneth on the steps. Like those who stand in the street and gape at the passers-by, thus do they also wait and gape at the thoughts which others have thought. Should one lay hold of them, then do they raise a dust like flower sacks and involuntarily. But who would divine that their dust came from corn and from the yellow delight of the summer fields? When they give themselves out as wise, then do their petty sayings and truths chill me. In their wisdom there is often an odor as if it came from the swamp, and verily I have even heard the frog croak in it. Clever are they. They have dexterous fingers. What doth my simplicity pretend to beside their multiplicity? All threading and knitting and weaving do their fingers understand, thus do they make the house of the spirit. Good clockworks are they, only be careful to wind them up properly. Then do they indicate the hour without mistake, and make a modest noise thereby. Like millstones do they work, and like pestles. Throw only seed corn unto them. They know well how to grind corn small and make white dust out of it. They keep a sharp eye on one another, and do not trust each other the best. Ingenious in little artifices, they wait for those whose knowledge walketh on lame feet, like spiders do they wait. I saw them always prepare their poison with precaution, and always did they put glass gloves on their fingers in doing so. They also know how to play with false dice, and so eagerly did I find them playing, that they perspired thereby. We are alien to each other, and their virtues are even more repugnant to my taste than their falsehoods and false dice. And when I lived with them, then did I live above them. Therefore did they take a dislike to me. They want to hear nothing of any one walking above their heads, and so they put wood and earth and rubbish betwixt me and their heads. Thus did they deafen the sound of my tread, and least have I hitherto been heard by the most learned. All mankind's faults and weaknesses did they put betwixt themselves and me. They call it false sealing in their houses. But nevertheless I walk with my thoughts above their heads, and even should I walk on mine own air, still would I be above them in their heads. For men are not equal, so speaketh justice, and what I will, they may not will. Thus spake Zarathustra. End chapter 38 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common, Part 2, Chapter 39, Poets. Since I have known the body better, said Zarathustra to one of his disciples, the spirit hath only been to me symbolically spirit, and all the imperishable, that is also but a simile. So have I heard thee say once before, answered the disciple. And then thou addest, But the poets lie too much. Why didst thou say that the poets lie too much? Why, said Zarathustra, thou asketh why? I do not belong to those who may be asked after their why. Is my experience but of yesterday? It is long ago that I experienced the reasons for mine opinions. Should I not have to be a cask of memory? if I also wanted to have my reasons with me. It is already too much for me even to retain mine opinions, 
and many a bird flieth away. And sometimes also do I find a fugitive creature in my dovecote, which is alien to me, and trembleth when I lay my hand upon it. But what did Zarathustra once say unto thee, that the poets lie too much? But Zarathustra is also a poet. Believest thou that he there spake the truth? Why dost thou believe it? The disciple answered, I believe in Zarathustra. But Zarathustra shook his head and smiled. Belief doth not sanctify me, said he, least of all the belief in myself. But granting that some one did say, in all seriousness, that the poets lie too much, he was right. We do lie too much. We also know too little, and are bad learners, so we are obliged to lie. And which of us poets hath not adulterated his wine? Many a poisonous hotchpotch hath evolved in our cellars, many an indescribable thing hath there been done. And because we know little, therefore are we pleased from the heart with the poor in spirit, especially when they are young women. And even of those things are we desirous, which old women tell one another in the evening. This do we call the eternally feminine in us. And as if there were a special secret access to knowledge, with choketh up for those who learn anything, so do we believe in the people and their wisdom. This, however, do all poets believe that whoever pricketh up his ears when lying in the grass or on lonely slopes learneth something of the things that are betwixt heaven and earth. And if there come unto them tender emotions, then do the poets always think that nature herself is in love with them, and that she stealeth to their ear to whisper secrets into it and amorous flatteries. Of this do they plume and pride themselves before all mortals. Ah, there are so many things betwixt heaven and earth of which only the poets have dreamed and especially above the heavens, for all gods are poets' symbolizations, poet sophistications. Verily, ever are we drawn aloft, that is, to the realm of the clouds. On these do we set our gaudy puppets, and then call them gods and supermen. Are not they light enough for those chairs? Are all these gods and supermen? Ah, how I am weary of all the inadequate that is insisted on as actual. Ah, how I am weary of the poets! When Zarathustra so spake, his disciple resented it, but was silent. And Zarathustra also was silent, and his eye directed itself inwardly, as if it gazed into the far distance. At last he sighed and drew breath. I am of to-day, and heretofore, said he thereupon, but something is in me, that is of the morrow, and the day following, and the hereafter. I became weary of the poets, of the old and of the new. Superficial are they all unto me in shallow seas. They did not think sufficiently into the depth, therefore their feeling did not reach to the bottom. Some sensation of voluptuousness and some sensation of tedium, these have as yet been their best contemplation. Ghost-breathing and ghost-whisking seemeth to me all the jingle-jangling of their harps. What have they known hitherto of the fervor of tones? They are also not pure enough for me. They all muddle their waters, that it may seem deep. And fain would they thereby prove themselves reconcilers, that mediaries and mixers are they unto me, and half and half, and impure. I cast indeed my net into their sea, and meant to catch good fish. But always did I draw up the head of some ancient god. Thus did the sea give a stone to the hungry one. And they themselves may well originate from the sea. Certainly one findeth pearls in them. Thereby they are the more like hard mollusks. And instead of a soul, I have often found in them salt slime. They have learned from the sea also its vanity. Is not the sea the peacock of peacocks? Even before the ugliest of all buffaloes doth it spread out its tail, never doth it tire of its lace fan of silver and silk. 
Disdainfully doth the buffalo glance thereat, nigh to the sand with its soul, nigher still to the thicket, nighest, however, to the swamp. What is beauty in sea and peacock? Splendor to it. This parable I speak unto the poets. Verily, their spirit itself is the peacock of peacocks in a sea of vanity. Spectators seeketh the spirit of the poet should they even be buffaloes. But of this spirit became I weary, and I see the time coming when it will become weary of itself. Yea, changed have I seen the poets, and their glance turned towards themselves. Penitents of the spirit have I seen appearing, they grew out of the poets. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 39 This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugwiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2. Chapter 40. Great Events. There is an isle in the sea, not far from the happy isles of Zarathustra, on which a volcano ever smoketh of which isle the people, and especially the old women amongst them, say that it is placed as a rock before the gate of the netherworld, but that through the volcano itself the narrow way leadeth downwards, which conducteth to this gate. Now about the time that Zarathustra sojourned on the happy isles, it happened that a ship anchored at the isle on which standeth the smoking mountain, and the crew went ashore to shoot rabbits. About the noontide hour, however, when the captain and his men were together again, they saw suddenly a man coming towards them through the air, and a voice said distinctly, It is time! It is the highest time! But when the figure was nearest to them, it flew past quickly, however, like a shadow in the direction of the volcano. Then did they recognize with the greatest surprise that it was Zarathustra, for they had all seen him before except the captain himself, and they loved him as the people love, in such wise that love and awe were combined in equal degree. Behold, said the helmsman, there goeth Zarathustra to hell. About the same time that these sailors landed on the fire isle, there was a rumor that Zarathustra had appeared, and when his friends were asked about it, they said that he had gone on board a ship by night, without saying whither he was going. Thus there arose some uneasiness. After three days, however, there came the story of the ship's crew in addition to this uneasiness, and then did all the people say that the devil had taken Zarathustra. His disciples laughed, sure enough, at this talk, and one of them said even, Sooner would I believe that Zarathustra hath taken the devil. But at the bottom of their hearts they were all full of anxiety and longing, so their joy was great when on the fifth day Zarathustra appeared amongst them. And this is the account of Zarathustra's interview with the fire-dog. The earth, said he, hath a skin, and this skin hath diseases. One of these diseases, for example, is called man. And another of these diseases is called the fire-dog. Concerning him... Men have greatly deceived themselves, and let themselves be deceived. To fathom this mystery did I go o'er the sea, and I have seen the truth naked verily, barefooted up to the neck. Now do I know how it is concerning the fire-dog, and likewise concerning all the spouting and subversive devils, of which not only old women are afraid. Up with thee, fire-dog, out of thy depth, cried I, and confess how deep that depth is, whence cometh that which thou snortest up. Thou drinketh copiously at the sea, that doth thine embittered eloquence betray. In sooth for a dog of the depth thou takest thy nourishment too much from the surface. At the most I regard thee as the ventriloquist of the earth, and ever, when I have heard subversive and spouting devils speak, I have found them like thee, embittered, mendacious, and shallow. Ye understand how to roar and obscure with ashes. 
ye are the best braggarts, and have sufficiently learned the art of making dregs boil. Where ye are, there must always be dregs at hand, and much that is spongy, hollow, and compressed. It wanteth to have freedom. Freedom ye all roar most eagerly. But I have unlearned the belief in great events, when there is much roaring and smoke about them. And believe me, friend Hullabaloo, the greatest events are not our noisiest, but our stillest hours. Not around the inventors of new noise, but around the inventors of new values, doth the world revolve. Inaudibly it revolveth. And just own to it. Little have never been taken place when thy noise and smoke passed away. What if a city did become a mummy, and a statue lay in the mud? And this do I say also to the o'erthrowers of statues. It is certainly the greatest folly to throw salt into the sea, and statues into the mud. In the mud of your contempt lay the statue, but it is just its law that out of contempt its life and living beauty grow again. With diviner features doth it now arise, seducing by its suffering, and verily it will yet thank you for overthrowing it, ye subverters. This counsel, however, do I counsel to kings and churches, and to all that is weak with age or virtue. Let yourselves be overthrown, that ye may again come to life, and that virtue may come to you. Thus spake I before the fire-dog, then did he interrupt me sullenly, and ask, Church, what is that? Church, answered I, that is a kind of state, and indeed the most spendacious. But remain quiet, thou dissembling dog, thou surely knowest thine own species best. Like thyself the state is a dissembling dog, like thee doth it like to speak with smoke and roaring, to make believe, like thee, that it speaketh out of the heart of things for it seeketh by all means to be the most important creature on earth, the state, and people think it so. When I had said this, the fire-dog acted as if mad with envy. What? cried he, the most important creature on earth, and people think it so? And so much vapour and terrible voices came out of his throat that I thought he would choke with vexation and envy. At last he became calmer, and his panting subsided. As soon, however, as he was quiet, I said laughingly, Thou art angry, fire-dog, so I am in the right about thee. And that I may also maintain the right, hear the story of another fire-dog. He speaketh actually out of the heart of the earth. Gold doth his breath exhale, and golden rain, so doth his heart desire. What are ashes and smoke and hot dregs to him? Laughter flitteth from him like a variegated cloud, Adverse is he to thy gargling, and spewing and grips in the bowels. The gold, however, and the laughter, these doth he take out of the heart of the earth. For that thou mayst know it, the heart of the earth is of gold. When the fire-dog heard this, he could no longer endure to listen to me. Abashed did he draw in his tail, said bow-wow in a cowed voice, and crept down into his cave. Thus told Zarathustra, his disciples, however, hardly listened to him, so great was their eagerness to tell him about the sailors, the rabbits, and the flying man. What am I to think of it, said Zarathustra? Am I indeed a ghost? But it may have been my shadow. Ye have surely heard something of the wanderer in his shadow. One thing, however, is certain. I must keep a tighter hold of it, otherwise it will spoil my reputation. And once more Zarathustra shook his head and wondered. What am I to think of it? said he once more. Why did the ghost cry, It is time, it is the highest time. For what is it then, the highest time? Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 40This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 2, Chapter 41 The Soothsayer 
and I saw a great sadness come over mankind. The best turned weary of their works. A doctrine appeared, a faith ran beside it. All is empty, all is alike, all hath been. And from all hills there re-echoed, All is empty, all is alike, all hath been. To be sure we have harvested, But why have all our fruits become rotten and brown? What was it fell last night from the evil moon? In vain was all our labor, Poison hath our wine become, the evil eye hath singed yellow our fields and hearts. Ere it have we all become, and fire falling upon us, then do we turn dust like ashes. Yea, the fire itself have we made a weary. All our fountains have dried up, even the sea hath receded. All the ground trieth to gape, but the depth will not swallow. Alas, where is there still a sea in which one could be drowned? So soundeth our plaint across shallow swamps. Verily, even for dying have we become too weary. Now do we keep awake and live on in sepulchres. Thus did Zarathustra hear a soothsayer speak and the foreboding touched his heart and transformed him. Sorrowfully did he go about, and wearily, and he became like unto those of whom the soothsayer had spoken. Verily said he unto his disciples, A little while, and there cometh the long twilight. Alas, how shall I preserve my light through it? That it may not smother in this sorrowfulness, to a remoter world shall it be a light, and also to remotest nights. Thus did Zarathustra go about grieved in his heart, and for three days he did not take any meat or drink. He had no rest and lost his speech. At last it came to pass that he fell into a deep sleep. His disciples, however, sat around him in long night watches, and waited anxiously to see if he would awake and speak again and recover from his affliction. And this is the discourse that Zarathustra spake when he awoke. His voice, however, came unto his disciples as from afar. Here I pray you, the dream that I dreamed, my friends, and help me to divine its meaning. A riddle is it still unto me, this dream. The meaning is hidden in it, and encaged, and doth not yet fly above it on free pinions. All life had I renounced, so I dreamed. Night watchman and grave guardian had I become, aloft in the lone mountain fortress of death. There did I guard his coffins, Full stood the musty vaults of those trophies of victory. Out of glass coffins did vanquished life gaze upon me. The odor of dust-covered eternities did I breathe, Sultry and dust-covered lay my soul. And who could have aired his soul there? Brightness of midnight was ever around me, Lonesomeness cowered beside her, And as a third death-rattled stillness, the worst of my female friends. Keys did I carry, the rustiest of all keys, and I knew how to open with them the most creaking of all gates. Like a bitterly angry croaking ran the sound through the long corridors when the leaves of the gate opened. Ungraciously did this bird cry, unwillingly was it awakened. But more frightful even, and more heart-strangling was it, when it again became silent and still all around, and I alone sat in that malignant silence. Thus did time pass with me, and slip by, if time there still was. What do I know thereof? But at last there happened that which awoke me. Thrice did there peal, 
peals at the gate, like thunders, thrice did the vaults resound and howl again. Then did I go to the gate. Alpa, cried I, who carrieth his ashes unto the mountain? Alpa, Alpa, who carrieth his ashes unto the mountain? And I pressed the key, and pulled at the gate, and exerted myself. But not a finger's breadth was it yet open. Then did a roaring wind tear the folds apart, whistling, whizzing, and piercing. It threw unto me a black coffin. And in the roaring and whistling and whizzing, the coffin burst up and spouted out a thousand peals of laughter. And a thousand caricatures of children, angels, owls, fools, and a child-sized butterflies laughed and mocked and roared at me. Fearfully was I terrified thereby, it prostrated me. And I cried with horror as never I cried before. But mine own crying awoke me, and I came to myself. Thus did Zarathustra relate his dream, and then was silent, for as yet he knew not the interpretation thereof. But the disciple, whom he loved most, rose quickly, seized Zarathustra's hand, and said, Thy life itself interpreteth unto us this dream, O Zarathustra. Art thou not thyself the wind with shrill whistling which bursteth open the gates of the fortress of death? Art thou not thyself the coffin full of many-hued malices and angel caricatures of life? Verily, like a thousand peals of children's laughter cometh Zarathustra into all sepulchres, laughing at those night watchmen and grave guardians, and whoever else rattleth with sinister keys. With thy laughter wilt thou frighten and prostrate them. Fainting and recovering will demonstrate thy power over them. And when the long twilight cometh, and the mortal weariness, even then wilt thou not disappear from our firmament, thou advocate of life. New stars hast thou made to see, a new nocturnal glories, Verily, laughter itself hast thou spread out over us, like a many-hued canopy. Now will children's laughter ever from coffins flow. Now will a stronger wind ever come victoriously unto all mortal weariness. Of this thou art thyself the pledge and the prophet. Verily, they themselves didst thou dream, thine enemies. That was thy sorest dream. But as thou awokest from them, and camest to thyself, so shall they awaken from themselves, and come unto thee. Thus spake the disciple, and all the others then thronged around Zarathustra, grasped him by the hands, and tried to persuade him to leave his bed in his sadness, and return unto them. Zarathustra, however, sat upright on his couch with an absent look like one returning from long foreign sojourn did he look on his disciples and examine their features but still he knew them not when however they raised him and set him upon his feet behold all on a sudden his eye changed he understood everything that had happened stroked his beard and said with a strong voice well this hath just its time but see to it, my disciples, that we have a good repast, and without delay. Thus do I mean to make amends for bad dreams. The soothsayer, however, shall eat and drink at my side, and verily I will yet show him a sea in which he can drown himself. Thus spake Zarathustra. Then did he gaze long into the face of the disciple who had been the dream interpreter, and shook his head. End of chapter 41. This is LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2. Chapter 42. Redemption. 
When Zarathustra went one day over the great bridge, then did the cripples and beggars surround him, and a hunchback spake thus unto him. Behold, Zarathustra, even the people learn from thee, and acquire faith in thy teaching. But for them to believe fully in thee, one thing is still needful. Thou must first of all convince us cripples. Here hast thou now a fine selection, and verily an opportunity with more than one forelock. The blind canst thou heal, and make the lame run. And from him who hath too much behind, couldst thou, well, also take away a little? That, I think, would be the right method to make the cripples believe in Zarathustra. Zarathustra, however, answered thus unto him who so spake. When one taketh his hump from the hunchback, then doth one take from him his spirit. So do the people teach. And when one giveth the blind man eyes, then doth he see too many bad things on the earth, so that he curseth him who healed him. He, however, who maketh the lame man run, inflicteth upon him the greatest injury. For hardly can he run when his vices run away with him. So do the people teach concerning cripples. And why should not Zarathustra also learn from the people, when the people learn from Zarathustra? It is, however, the smallest thing unto me, since I have been amongst men, to see one person lacking an eye, another an ear, and a third a leg, and that others have lost the tongue or the nose or the head. I see and have seen worse things, and diverse things, so hideous that I should neither like to speak of all matters, nor even keep silent about some of them, namely men who lack everything, except that they have too much of one thing, men who are nothing more than a big eye, or a big mouth, or a big belly, or something else big. Reversed cripples, I call such men. And when I came out of my solitude, and for the first time passed over this bridge, then I could not trust mine eyes, but looked again and again, and said at last, That is an ear, an ear as big as a man. I looked still more attentively, and actually there did move under the ear something that was pitiably small and poor and slim. And in truth, this immense ear was perched on a small, thin stalk. The stalk, however was a man. A person putting a glass to his eyes could even recognize further a small envious countenance, and also that a bloated soullet dangled at the stalk. The people told me, however, that the big ear was not only a man, but a great man, a genius. But I never believed in the people when they spake of great men, and I hold to my belief that it was a reversed cripple who had too little of everything and too much of one thing. When Zarathustra had spoken thus unto the hunchback, and unto those of whom the hunchback was the mouthpiece and advocate, then did he turn to his disciples in profound dejection, and said, Verily, my friends, I walkest amongst men as amongst the fragments and limbs of human beings. This is the terrible thing to mine eye that I find man broken up and scattered about, as on a battle and butcher ground. And when mine eye fleeth from the present to the bygone, it findeth ever the same, fragments and limbs and fearful chances, but no men. The present and the bygone upon earth. Ah, my friends, that is my most unbearable trouble. And I should not know how to live, if I were not a seer of what is to come. A seer, a purposer, a creator, a future itself, and a bridge to the future. And alas, also as it were a cripple on this bridge, all that is Zarathustra. And ye also asked yourselves often, Who is Zarathustra to us? What shall he be called by us? And like me, did ye give yourselves questions for answers? Is he a promiser, or a fulfiller, 
a conqueror or an inheritor, a harvest or a plowshare, a physician or a healed one? Is he a poet or a genuine one, an emancipator or a subjugator, a good one or an evil one? I walk amongst men as the fragments of the future, that future which I contemplate. And it is all my poetization and aspiration to compose and to collect into unity what is fragment and riddle and fearful chance. And how could I endure to be a man if man were not also the composer and riddle reader and redeemer of chance? To redeem what is past and to transform every it was into thus would I have it. That only do I call redemption. Will. So is the emancipator and joy-bringer called. Thus have I taught you, my friends. But now learn this likewise. The will itself is still a prisoner. Willing emancipateth. But what is that called which still putteth the emancipator in chains? It was, thus is the will's teeth gnashing and lonesomest tribulation called, impotent towards what hath been done. It is a malicious spectator of all that is past. Not backward can the will will, that it cannot break time and time's desire. That is the will's lonesomest tribulation. Willing emancipateth. What doth willing itself devise in order to get free from its tribulation and mock at its prison? Ah, a fool becometh every prisoner. Foolishly delivereth itself also the imprisoned will. The time doth not run backward. That is its animosity. That which was. So is the stone which it cannot roll called. And thus doth it roll stones out of animosity and ill-humor, and taketh revenge on whatever doth not, like it, feel rage and ill-humor. Thus did the will, the emancipator, become a torturer, and on all that is capable of suffering it taketh revenge, because it cannot go backward. This, yea, this alone is revenge itself the will's antipathy to time, and its it was. Verily, a great folly dwelleth in our will, and it became a curse unto all humanity that this folly acquired spirit. The spirit of revenge. My friends, that hath hitherto been man's best contemplation, and where there was suffering, it was claimed there was always penalty. Penalty so calleth itself revenge. With a lying word it feigneth a good conscience. And because in the willer himself there is suffering, because he cannot will backwards, thus was willing itself and all life claimed to be penalty. And then did cloud after cloud roll over the spirit, until at last madness preached, everything perisheth, therefore everything deserveth to perish. And this itself is justice, the law of time, that he must devour his children. Thus did madness preach. Morally are things ordered according to justice and penalty. Oh, where is the deliverance from the flux of things and from the existence of penalty? Thus did madness preach. Can there be deliverance when there is eternal justice? Alas, unrollable is the stone, it was. Eternal must also be all penalties, thus did madness preach. No deed can be annihilated, how could it be undone by the penalty? This, this is what is eternal in the existence of penalty. That existence also must be eternally recurring deed and guilt unless the will should at last deliver itself, and willing become non-willing. But ye know, my brethren, this fabulous song of madness. 
away from those fabulous songs did I lead you when I taught you. The will is a creator. All it was is a fragment, a riddle, a fearful chance, until the creating will saith thereto, but this would I have it. Until the creating will saith thereto, but thus do I will it, thus shall I will it. But did it ever speak thus? And when doth this take place? Hath the will been unharnessed from its own folly? Hath the will become its own deliverer and joy-bringer? Hath it unlearned the spirit of revenge and all teeth-gnashing? And who hath taught it reconciliation with time and something higher than all reconciliation? Something higher than all reconciliation must the will will, which is the will to power. But how doth that take place? Who hath taught it also to will backwards? But at this point in his discourse it chanced that Zarathustra suddenly paused, and looked like a person in the greatest alarm. With terror in his eyes did he gaze on his disciples, his glances pierced as with arrows their thoughts and arrear thoughts. But after a brief space he again laughed and said soothedly, It is difficult to live amongst men, because silence is so difficult, especially for a babbler. Thus spake Zarathustra. The hunchback, however, had listened to the conversation, and had covered his face during the time. But when he heard Zarathustra laugh, he looked up with curiosity, and said slowly, But why does Zarathustra speak otherwise unto us than unto his disciples? Zarathustra answered, What is there to be wondered at? With hunchbacks one may well speak in a hunchbacked way. Very good, said the hunchback, and with pupils one may well tell tales out of school. But why does Zarathustra speak otherwise unto his pupils than unto himself? End of chapter 42This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 2, Chapter 43 Manly Prudence Not the height, it is the declivity that is terrible. The declivity where the gaze shooteth downwards, and the hand graspeth upwards. There doth the heart become giddy through its double will. Ah, friends, do ye divine also my heart's double will? This, this is my declivity and my danger, that my gaze shooteth towards the summit, and my hand would fain clutch and lean on the depth. To man clingeth my will, with chains do I bind myself to man, because I am pulled upwards to the superman. For thither doth my other will tend. And therefore do I live blindly among men, as if I knew them not, that my hand may not entirely lose belief in firmness. I know not you men, this gloom and consolation is often spread around me, I sit at the gateway for every rogue and ask, Who wisheth to deceive me? This is my first manly prudence, that I allow myself to be deceived, so as not to be on my guard against deceivers. Ah, uh, if I were on my guard against man, how could man be an anchor to my ball? Too easily would I be pulled upwards and away. This providence is over my fate that I have to be without foresight. And he who would not languish amongst men must learn to drink out of all glasses. And he who would keep clean amongst men must know how to wash himself even with dirty water. And thus spake I often to myself for consolation. Courage! Cheer up, old heart! And unhappiness hath failed to befall thee, 
enjoy that as thy happiness. This, however, is mine other manly prudence. I am more forbearing to the vain than to the proud. Is not wounded vanity the mother of all tragedies? Where, however, pride is wounded, there there groweth up something better than pride. That life may be fair to behold, its game must be well played. For that purpose, however, it needeth good actors. Good actors have I found all the vain ones. They play and wish people to be fond of beholding them. All their spirit is in this wish. They represent themselves, they invent themselves. In their neighborhood I like to look upon life. It cureth of melancholy. Therefore am I forbearing to the vain, because they are the physicians of my melancholy, and keep me attached to man as to a drama. And further, who conceiveth the full depth of the modesty of the vain man? I am favorable to him, and sympathetic on account of his modesty. From you would he learn his belief in himself. He feedeth upon your glances, he eateth praise out of your hands. Your lies doth even he believe when you lie favorably about him, for in its depths sigheth his heart. What am I? And if that be the true virtue which is unconscious of itself, well, the vain man is unconscious of his modesty. This is, however, my third manly prudence. I am not put out of conceit with the wicked by your timorousness. I am happy to see the marvels the warm sun hatcheth, tigers and palms and rattlesnakes. Also among men, there is a beautiful brood of the warm sun, and much that is marvellous in the wicked. In truth, as your wisest did not seem to me so very wise, so found I also human wickedness below the fame of it. And oft did I ask with a shake of the head, Why still rattle, ye rattlesnakes? Verily, there is still a future even for evil, and the warmest south is still undiscovered by man. How many things are now called the worst wickedness, which are only twelve feet broad and three months long? Some day, however, will greater dragons come into the world. For that the superman may not lack his dragon, the super-dragon that is worthy of him, there must still much warm sun glow on moist virgin forests, out of your wild cats must tigers have evolved, and out of your poison toads crocodiles. For the good hunter shall have a good hunt. And verily, ye good and just. In you there is much to be laughed at, and especially your fear of what hath hitherto been called the devil. So alien are ye in your souls to what is great, that to you the superman would be frightful in his goodness. And ye wise and knowing ones, ye would flee from the solar glow of the wisdom in which the superman joyfully batheth his nakedness. Ye highest men who have come within my ken, this is my doubt of you and my secret laughter. I suspect ye would call my superman a devil. Ah, I became tired of those highest and best ones. From their height did I long to be up out and away to the superman. A horror came over me when I saw those best ones naked. Then there grew for me the pinions to soar away into distant futures, into more distant futures, into more southern souths than ever artists dreamed of, thither where gods are ashamed of all clothes. But disguised do I want to see you, ye neighbors and fellow-men, and well-attired and vain and estimable, as the good and just. And disguise will I myself sit amongst you, that I may mistake you and myself, for that is my last manly prudence. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 43 
This is a LibriVox.org recording by Jeff Dugweiler. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 2. Chapter 44. The Stillest Hour. What hath happened unto me, my friends? Ye see me troubled, driven forth unwillingly, obedient, ready to go, alas, to go away from you. Yea, once more must Zarathustra retire to his solitude, but unjoyously this time doth the bear go back to his cave. What hath happened unto me? Who ordereth this? Ah, mine angry mistress wisheth it so, she spake unto me. Have I ever named her name to you? Yesterday towards evening there spake unto me my stillest hour. That is the name of my terrible mistress. And thus did it happen. For everything must I tell you, that your heart may not harden against the suddenly departing one. Do ye know the terror of him who falleth asleep? To the very toes he is terrified, because the ground giveth way under him, and the dream beginneth. This do I speak unto you in parable. Yesterday at the stillest hour did the ground give way under me. The dream began. The hour hand moved on, the timepiece of my life drew breath. Never did I hear such stillness around me, so that my heart was terrified. Then was there spoken unto me without voice, Thou knowest it, Zarathustra. And I cried in terror at this whispering, and the blood left my face, but I was silent. Then was there once more spoken unto me without voice, Thou knowest it, Zarathustra, but thou dost not speak it. And at last I answered, like one defiant, Yea, I know, but I will not speak it. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice, Thou wilt not, Zarathustra. Is this true? Conceal thyself not behind thy defiance. And I wept and trembled like a child, and said, ah, I would indeed, but how can I do it? Exempt me only from this. It is beyond my power. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice. What matter about thyself, Zarathustra? Speak thy word and succumb. And I answered, Ah, is it my word? Who am I? I await the worthier one. I am not worthy even to succumb by it. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice. What matter about thyself? Thou art not yet humble enough for me. Humility hath the hardest skin. And I answered, What hath not the skin of my humility endured? At the foot of my height do I dwell. How high are my summits? No one hath yet told me, but well do I know my valleys. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice, O oh, Zarathustra, he who hath to remove mountains, removeth also valleys and plains. And I answered, As yet hath my word not removed mountains, and what I have spoken hath not reached man. I went indeed unto men, but not yet have I attained unto them. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice. What knowest thou thereof? The dew falleth on the grass when the night is most silent. And I answered, they mocked me when I found and walked in mine own path, and certainly did my feet then tremble. And thus did they speak unto me, 
Thou forgottest the path before, now dost thou also forget how to walk. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice. What matter about their mockery? Thou art one who hast unlearned to obey. Now shalt thou command. Knowest thou not who is most needed by all? He who commandeth great things. Execute great things is difficult, but the more difficult task is to command great things. This is thy most unpardonable obstinacy. Thou hast the power, and thou wilt not roll. And I answered, I lack the lion's voice for all commanding. Then was there again spoken unto me as a whispering. It is the stillest words which bring the storm. Thoughts that come with doves' footsteps guide the world. O Zarathustra, thou shalt go as a shadow of that which is to come. Thus wilt thou command, and in commanding, go foremost. And I answered, I am ashamed. Then was there again spoken unto me without voice. Thou must yet become a child and be without shame. The pride of youth is still upon thee. Late hast thou become young, but he who would become a child must surmount even his youth. And I considered a long while, and trembled. At last, however, did I say what I had said at first. I will not. Then did a laughing take place all around me. Alas, how that laughing lacerated my bowels and cut into my heart. And there was spoken unto me for the last time. Oh, Zarathustra! Thy fruits are ripe, but thou art not ripe for thy fruits. So must thou go again into solitude, for thou shalt yet become mellow. And again was there a laughing, and it fled. Then did it become still around me as with a double stillness. I lay, however, on the ground, and the sweat flowed from my limbs. Now have ye heard all, and why I have to return into my solitude. Nothing have I kept hidden from you, my friends. But even this have ye heard from me, who is still the most reserved of men, and will be so. Ah, my friends! I should have something more to say unto you. I should have something more to give unto you. Why do I not give it? Am I then a niggard? When, however, Zarathustra had spoken these words, the violence of his pain and a sense of the nearness of his departure from his friends came over him, so that he wept aloud, and no one knew how to console him. In the night, however, he went away alone and left his friends. End of chapter 44 End of part 2 Recorded by Jeff Dugweiler, 2008
He who climbeth on the highest mountains, laugheth at all the tragic plays and tragic realities. Zarathustra, Part 1, Reading and Writing Chapter 45 The Wanderer Then, when it was about midnight, Zarathustra went on his way over the ridge of the isle, that he might arrive early in the morning at the other coast, because there he meant to embark. For there was a good roadstead there, in which foreign ships also liked to anchor. Those ships took many people with them, who wished to cross over from the Happy Isles. So when Zarathustra thus ascended the mountain, he thought on the way of his many solitary wanderings from youth onwards, and how many mountains and ridges and summits he had already climbed. I am a wanderer and mountain climber, said he to his heart. I love not the plains, and it seemeth I cannot long sit still. And whatever may still overtake me as fate and experience, a wandering will be therein, and a mountain climbing. In the end one experienceth only oneself. The time is now past, when accidents could befall me, and what could now fall to my lot, which would not already be mine own. It returneth only, it cometh here to me at last, mine own self, and such of it as hath been long abroad, and scattered among things and accidents. And one thing more do I know, I stand now before my last summit, and before that which has been longest reserved for me. Ah, my hardest path must I ascend. Ah, I have begun my lonesomest wandering. He, however, who is of my nature, doth not avoid such an hour, the hour that saith unto him, Now only dost thou go the way to thy greatness. Summit and abyss, these are now comprised together. Thou goest the way to thy greatness. Now hath it become thy last refuge, what was hitherto thy last danger. Thou goest the way to thy greatness. It must now be thy best courage, that there is no longer any path behind thee. Thou goest the way to thy greatness. Here shall no one steal after thee. Thy foot itself has effaced the path behind thee, and ever it standeth written, Impossibility. And if all ladders henceforth fail thee, then thou must learn to mount upon thine own head. How couldst thou mount upward otherwise? Upon thine own head, and beyond thine own heart, now must the gentlest in thee become the hardest. He who hath always much indulged himself, sickeneth at last by his much indulgence. Praises on what maketh hardy. I do not praise the land where butter and honey flow. To learn to look away from oneself is necessary in order to see many things. This hardiness is needed by every mountain climber. He, however, who is obtrusive, with his eyes as a discerner, how can he ever see more of anything than its foreground? But thou, O Zarathustra, wouldst view the ground of everything, and its background. Thus must thou mount even above thyself, up, upwards, until thou hast even thy stars under thee. Yea, to look down upon myself, and even upon my stars, that only would I call my summit, that hath remained for me as my last summit. Thus spake Zarathustra to himself, while ascending, comforting his heart with harsh maxims, for he was sore at heart, as he had never been before. And when he had reached the top of the mountain ridge, behold, there lay the other sea spread out before him, and he stood still and was long silent. The night, however, was cold at this height, and clear and starry. I recognize my destiny, said he at last, sadly. Well, I am ready. Now hath my last lonesomeness begun. 
Ah, this sombre sad sea below me. Ah, this sombre nocturnal vexation. Ah, fate and sea. To you must I now go down. Before my highest mountain do I stand, and before my longest wandering. Therefore must I go deeper down than I ever ascended. Deeper down into pain than I ever ascended even into its darkest flood. So willeth my fate. Well, I am ready. Whence came the highest mountains? So did I once ask. Then did I learn that they came out of the sea. That testimony is inscribed on their stones and on the walls of their summits. Out of the deepest must the highest come to its height. Thus spake Zarathustra on the ridge of the mountain where it was cold, when, however, he came into the vicinity of the sea, and at last stood alone amongst the cliffs. Then he had become weary on his way, and eagerer than ever before. Everything as yet sleepeth, said he, even the sea sleepeth. Drowsily and strangely doth its eye gaze upon me, but it breatheth warmly, I feel it, and I feel also that it dreameth. It tosseth about dreamily on hard pillows. Hark, hark, how it groaneth with evil recollections, or evil expectations. Ah, I am sad along with thee, thou dusky monster, and angry with myself even for thy sake. Ah, oh, that my hand hath not strength enough! Gladly indeed would I free thee from evil dreams. And while Zarathustra thus spake, he laughed at himself with melancholy and bitterness. What, Zarathustra, said he, wilt thou even sing consolation to the sea? Ah, thou amiable fool, Zarathustra, thou too blindly confiding one! But thus hast thou ever been, ever hast thou approached confidently all that is terrible. Every monster wouldst thou caress, a whiff of warm breath, a little soft tuft on its paw, and immediately wert thou ready to love and lure it. Love is the danger of the lonesomest one. Love to anything, if it only live. Laughable, verily, is my folly, and my modesty in love. Thus spake Zarathustra, and laughed thereby a second time. Then, however, he thought of his abandoned friends, and, as if he had done them wrong with his thoughts, he upbraided himself because of his thoughts, and forthwith it came to pass that the laughter wept, with anger and longing, wept Zarathustra bitterly. End of chapter 45「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Thus spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Chapter 46 The Vision and the Enigma 1. When it got abroad among the sailors that Zarathustra was on board the ship, for a man who came from the Happy Isles had gone on board along with him, there was great curiosity and expectation. But Zarathustra kept silent for two days, and was cold and deaf with sadness, so that he neither answered looks nor questions. On the evening of the second day, however, he again opened his ears, though he still kept silent, for there were many curious and dangerous things to be heard on board the ship, which came from afar, and was to go still further. Zarathustra, however, was fond of all those who make distant voyages, 
and dislike to live without danger. And behold, when listening, his own tongue was at last loosened, and the ice of his heart broke. Then did he begin to speak thus. To you, the daring venturous and adventurous, and whoever has embarked with cunning sails upon frightful seas, to you, the enigma intoxicated, the twilight enjoyers, whose souls are allured by flutes to every treacherous gulf. For ye dislike to grope at a thread with cowardly hand, and where ye can divine, there do ye hate to calculate. To you only do I tell the enigma that I saw, the vision of the lonesomest one. Gloomily walked I lately in corpse-coloured twilight, gloomily and sternly, with compressed lips. Not only one sun had set for me. A path which ascended daringly among boulders, an evil, lonesome path, which neither herb nor shrub any longer cheered, a mountain path, crunched under the daring of my foot. Mutely marching over the scornful clinking of pebbles, trampling the stone that let it slip, Thus did my foot force its way upwards. Upwards, in spite of the spirit that drew it downwards, towards the abyss, the spirit of gravity, my devil and arch-enemy. Upwards, although it sat upon me, half dwarf, half mole, paralysed, paralysing, dripping lead in mine ear, and thoughts like drops of lead into my brain. O oh, Zarathustra! It whispered scornfully, syllable by syllable, Thou stone of wisdom, thou threwest thyself high, But every thrown stone must fall. O Zarathustra, thou stone of wisdom, Thou slingstone, thou star-destroyer, Thyself threwest thou so high, But every thrown stone must fall. Condemned of thyself, and to thine own stoning, O Zarathustra, far indeed threwest thou thy stone, but upon thyself will it recoil. Then was the dwarf silent, and it lasted long. The silence, however, oppressed me, and to be thus in pairs, one is verily lonesomer than when alone. I ascended, I ascended, I dreamt, I thought, but everything oppressed me. A sick one did I resemble, whom bad torture wearieth, and a worse dream reawakeneth out of his first sleep. But there is something in me which I call courage. It hath hitherto slain for me every dejection. This courage at last bade me stand still and say, Dwarf! Thou or I. For courage is the best slayer, Courage which attacketh, For in every attack there is sound of triumph. Man, however, is the most courageous animal, Thereby hath he overcome every animal. With sound of triumph hath he overcome every pain, Human pain, however, is the sorest pain. Courage slayeth also giddiness at abysses. And where doth man not stand at abysses? Is not seeing itself seeing abysses? Courage is the best slayer. Courage slayeth also fellow-suffering. Fellow-suffering, however, is the deepest abyss. As deeply as man looketh into life, so deeply also doth he look into suffering. Courage, however, is the best slayer, courage which attacketh. It slayeth even death itself, for it saith, Was that life? Well, once more. In such speech, however, there is much sound of triumph. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. 2. Halt, dwarf! said I, either I or thou. I, however, am the stronger of the two. Thou knowest not mine abysmal thought. 
it couldst thou not endure. Then happened that which made me lighter, for the dwarf sprang from my shoulder, the prying sprite, and it squatted on a stone in front of me. There was, however, a gateway, just where we halted. Look at this gateway, dwarf, I continued. It has two faces. Two roads come together here. These has no one yet gone to the end of. This long lane backwards, it continues for an eternity. And that long lane forward, that is another eternity. They are antithetical to one another, these roads. They directly abut on one another. And it is here, at this gateway, that they come together. The name of the gateway is inscribed above, this moment. But should one follow them further, and even further and further on, thinkest thou, dwarf, that these roads would be eternally antithetical? Everything straight lieth, murmured the dwarf contemptuously. All truth is crooked. Time itself is a circle. Thou spirit of gravity, said I wrathfully, do not take it too lightly, or I shall let thee squat where thou squattest, Haltfoot, and I carry thee high. Observe, continued I, this moment, from the gateway, this moment, there runneth a long eternal lane backwards. Behind us lies an eternity. Must not whatever can run its course of all things have already run along that lane? Must not whatever can happen of all things have already happened, resulted, and gone by? And if everything have already existed... What thinkest thou, dwarf, of this moment? Must not this gateway also have already existed? And are not all things closely bound together in such wise that this moment draweth all coming things after it? Consequently, itself also? For whatever can run its course of all things, also in this long lane outward, must it once more run. And this slow spider which creepeth in the moonlight, and this moonlight itself, and thou and I in this gateway, whispering together, whispering of eternal things, must we not all have already existed? And must we not return, and run in that other lane out before us, that long weird lane, must we not eternally return? Thus did I speak, and always more softly, for I was afraid of mine own thoughts, and arrear thoughts. Then suddenly did I hear a dog howl near me. Had I ever heard a dog howl thus? My thoughts ran back. Yes, when I was a child, in my most distant childhood. Then did I hear a dog howl thus and saw it also, with hair bristling, its head upwards, trembling in the stillest midnight, when even dogs believe in ghosts. So that it excited my commiseration, for just then went the full moon, silent as death, over the house, just then did it stand still, a glowing globe, at rest from the flat roof, as if on someone's property. There had the dog been terrified, for dogs believe in thieves and ghosts. And when I again heard such howling, then did it excite my commiseration once more. Where was now the dwarf, and the gateway, and the spider, and all the whispering? Had I dreamt? Had I awakened? Twixt rugged rocks did I suddenly stand alone, dreary in the dreariest moonlight. But there lay a man, and there, the dog leaping, bristling, whining, now did it see me coming, then did it howl again, then did it cry, had I ever heard a dog cry so for help. 
and verily what I saw, the like had I never seen. A young shepherd did I see, rising, choking, quivering, with distorted countenance, and with a heavy black serpent hanging out of his mouth. Had I ever seen so much loathing and pale horror on one countenance? He had perhaps gone to sleep, then had the serpent crawled into his throat. There had it bitten itself fast. My hand pulled at the serpent and pulled. In vain. I failed to pull the serpent out of his throat. Then there cried out of me, Bite! Bite! Its head off! Bite! So cried it out of me, My horror, my hatred, my loathing, my pity, all my good and my bad, cried with one voice out of me. He daring ones around me, ye venturous and adventurous, and whoever of you have embarked with cunning sails on unexplored seas, ye enigma enjoyers, solve unto me the enigma that I then beheld, interpret unto me the vision of the lonesomest one, for it was a vision and a foresight. What did I then behold in parable? And who is it that must come some day? Who is the shepherd into whose throat the serpent thus crawled? Who is the man into whose throat all the heaviest and blackest will thus crawl? The shepherd, however, bit, as my cry had admonished him. He bit with a strong bite, Far away did he spit the head of the serpent, and sprang up. No longer shepherd, no longer man, a transfigured being, a light-surrounded being, that laughed. Never on earth laughed a man as he laughed. O oh, my brethren, I heard a laughter which was no human laughter, and now gnaws a thirst at me, a longing that is never allayed. My longing for that laughter gnaws at me. Oh, how can I still endure to live? And how could I endure to die at present? Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 46「This is a LibriVox recording. Thus spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translation by Thomas Common Read by Dromysius Third Part Chapter 47 Involuntary Bliss With such enigmas and bitterness in his heart did Zarathustra sail over the sea. When, however, he was four day journeys from the Happy Isles and from his friends, then had he surmounted all his pain. Triumphantly and with firm foot did he again accept his fate. And then talked Zarathustra in this wise to his exulting conscience. Alone am I again, and like to be so, alone with the pure heaven and the open sea, and again is the afternoon around me. On an afternoon did I find my friends for the first time, on an afternoon also did I find them a second time, at the hour when all light becometh stiller. For whatever happiness is still on its way twixt heaven and earth, now seeketh for lodging a luminous soul. With happiness hath all light now become stiller. O oh, afternoon of my life! Once did my happiness also descend to the valley that it might seek a lodging. Then did it find those open, hospitable souls. O oh, afternoon of my life! What did I not surrender that I might have one thing? this living plantation of my thoughts, and this dawn of my highest hope. Companions did the Creating One once seek, and children of his hope. And lo, it turned out that he could not find them, except he himself should first create them. Thus am I in the midst of my work, to my children going and from them returning. For the sake of his children must Zarathustra perfect himself. For in one's heart one loveth only one's child and one's work. And where there is great love to oneself, then is it the sign of pregnancy.
So have I found it. Still are my children verdant in their first spring, standing nigh one another, and shaken in common by the winds, the trees of my garden and of my best soil. And verily, where such trees stand beside one another, there are happy isles. But one day I will take them up, and put each by itself alone, that it may learn lonesomeness and defiance and prudence. Gnarled and crooked and with flexible hardness shall it then stand by the sea, a living lighthouse of unconquerable life. Yonder where the storms rush down into the sea, and the snout of the mountain drinketh water, shall each on a time have his day and night watches for his testing and recognition recognized and tested shall each be to see if he be of my type and lineage if he be master of a long will silent even when he speaketh and giving in such wise that he taketh in giving so that he may one day become my companion my fellow creator and fellow enjoyer with zarathustra such a one as writeth my will on my tables for the fuller perfection of all things and for his sake and for those like him i must perfect myself therefore do i now avoid my happiness and present myself to every misfortune for my final testing and recognition and verily it were time that i went away and the wanderer's shadow and the longest tedium and the stillest hour have all said unto me it is the highest time. The word blew to me through the keyhole and said, Come. The door sprang subtly open to me and said, Go. But I lay enchained to my love for my children. Desire spread this snare for me, the desire for love, that I should become the prey of my children and lose myself in them. Desiring, that is now for me to have lost myself. I possess you, my children. In this possessing shall everything be assurance and nothing desire. But brooding lay the son of my love upon me. In his own juice stewed Zarathustra, then did shadows and doubts fly past me. For frost and winter I now longed. Oh, that frost and winter would again make me crack and crunch, sighed I. Then arose icy mist out of me. My past burst its tomb. My pains, buried alive, woke up. Fully slept had they merely, concealed in corpse clothes. So called everything unto me in signs. It is time. But I heard not, until at last mine abyss moved, and my thought bit me. Ah, abysmal thought! Which art my thought? When shall I find strength to hear thee burrowing, and no longer tremble? To my very throat throbbeth my heart when I hear thee burrowing. Thy muteness even is like to strangle me, thou abysmal mute one. As yet have I never ventured to call thee up. It hath been enough that I have carried thee about with me. As yet have I not been strong enough for my final lion wantonness and playfulness. Sufficiently formidable unto me hath my weight ever been. But one day shall I find the strength and the lion's voice which will call thee up. When I shall have surmounted myself therein, then will I surmount myself also in that which is greater, and a victory shall be the seal of my perfection. Meanwhile do I sail along on uncertain seas. Chance flattereth me, smooth-tongued chance, forward and backward do I gaze. Still I see no end. As yet hath the hour of my final struggle not come to me. Or doth it come to me perhaps just now? Verily, with insidious beauty do sea and life gaze upon me round about. O oh, afternoon of my life! O oh, happiness before eventide! O oh, haven upon high seas! O oh, peace in uncertainty! How I distrust all of you! Verily distrustful am I of your insidious beauty. Like the lover am I who distrusteth too sleek smiling. As he pusheth the best loved before him, tender even in severity, the jealous one, so do I push this blissful hour before me. Away with thee, thou blissful hour, 
With thee hath there come to me an involuntary bliss. Ready for my severest pain do I here stand. At the wrong time hast thou come. Away with thee, thou blissful hour. Rather harbor there with my children. Hasten and bless them before eventide with my happiness. There already approacheth eventide. The sun sinketh. Away my happiness. Thus spake Zarathustra. And he waited for his misfortune the whole night, but he waited in vain. The night remained clear and calm, and happiness itself came nigher and nigher unto him. Towards morning, however, Zarathustra laughed to his heart, and said mockingly, Happiness runneth after me. That is because I do not run after women. Happiness, however, is a woman. End of chapter 47 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 48 Before Sunrise O heaven above me, thou pure, thou deep heaven, Thou abyss of light, gazing on thee, I tremble with divine desires. Up to thy height to toss myself, that is my depth. In thy purity to hide myself, that is mine innocence. The God veileth his beauty, thus hidest thou thy stars. Thou speakest not, thus proclaimest thou thy wisdom unto me. Mute o'er the raging sea, Hast thou risen for me to-day, thy love and thy modesty make a revelation unto my raging soul. In that thou camest unto me beautiful, veiled in thy beauty, in that thou spakest unto me mutely, obvious in thy wisdom. O, oh, how could I fail to divine all the modesty of thy soul? Before the sun didst thou come unto me, the lonesomest one. We have been friends from the beginning, to us are grief, gruesomeness, and ground common. Even the sun is common to us. We do not speak to each other, because we know too much. We keep silent to each other. We smile our knowledge to each other. Art thou not the light of my fire? Hast thou not the sister soul of mine insight? Together did we learn everything. Together did we learn to ascend beyond ourselves to ourselves, and to smile uncloudedly uncloudedly to smile down out of luminous eyes and out of miles of distance, when under us constraint and purpose and guilt steam like rain. And wandered I alone, for what did my soul hunger by night and in labyrinthine paths? And climbed I mountains, whom did I ever seek, if not thee upon mountains? And all my wandering and mountain climbing, a necessity was it merely, and a makeshift of the unhandy one, to fly only wanteth mine entire will, to fly into thee. And whatever hated more than passing clouds, and whatever tainteth thee, and mine own hatred have I even hated, because it tainted thee. The passing clouds I detest, those stealthy cats of prey, they take from thee and me what is common to us, the vast unbounded yea and amen saying. These mediators and mixers we detest, the passing clouds, those half and half ones, that have neither learned to bless nor to curse from the heart. Rather will I sit in a tub under a closed heaven, rather will I sit in the abyss without heaven, than see thee, thou luminous heaven, tainted with passing clouds, and oft have I longed to pin them fast with the jagged gold wires of lightning, that I might, like the thunder, beat the drum upon their kettle bellies. An angry drummer, because they rob me of thy yea and amen, thou heaven above me, thou pure, thou luminous heaven, thou abyss of light, 
because they rob thee of my yea and amen. For rather will I have noise and thunders and tempest blasts than this discreet doubting cat repose, and also amongst men do I hate most of the soft treaders and half and half ones and the doubting hesitating passing clouds. And he who cannot bless shall learn to curse. This clear teaching dropped unto me from the clear heaven, this star standeth in my heaven, even in dark nights. I, however, am a blesser and a yeasayer. If thou be but around me, thou pure, thou luminous heaven, thou abyss of light, into all abysses do I then carry my beneficent yeasaying. A blesser have I become and a yeasayer, and therefore strove I long, and was a striver, that I might one day get my hands free for blessing. This, however, is my blessing, to stand above everything as its own heaven, its round roof, its azure bell and eternal security, and blessed is he who thus blesseth. For all things are baptized at the front of eternity, and beyond good and evil. Good and evil themselves, however, are but fugitive shadows and damp afflictions and passing clouds. Verily, it is a blessing and not a blasphemy when I teach that above all things there standeth the heaven of chance, the heaven of innocence, the heaven of hazard, the heaven of wantonness. Of hazard, that is the oldest nobility in the world that gave her back to all things. I emancipated them from bondage under purpose. This freedom and celestial serenity did I put like an azure bell above all things, when I taught that over them and through them no eternal will willeth. This wantonness and folly did I put in place of that will, when I taught that in everything there is one thing impossible, rationality. A little reason, to be sure, a germ of wisdom scattered from star to star, this heaven is mixed in all things, for the sake of folly, wisdom is mixed in all things. A little wisdom is indeed possible, but this blessed security have I found in all things that they prefer to dance on the feet of chance. O heaven above me, thou pure, thou lofty heaven, this is now thy purity unto me, that there is no eternal reason spider and reason cobweb, that thou art to me dancing-floor for divine chances, that thou art to me a table of the gods for divine dice and dice-players. But thou blushest? Have I spoken unspeakable things? Have I abused when I meant to bless thee? Or is it the shame of being two of us that maketh thee blush? Dost thou bid me go and be silent, because now day cometh? The world is deep, and deeper than e'er the day could read. Not everything may be uttered in presence of day, but day cometh, so let us part. O heaven above me, thou modest one, thou glowing one, O thou my happiness before sunrise, the day cometh, so let us part. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part 48 Recorded by Gesine in September 2007This is a LibriVox.org recording by Gesine. This recording is in the public domain. Thus spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 49 The Bedwarfing Virtue 1. When Zarathustra was again on the continent, he did not go straightway to his mountains and his cave, but made many wanderings and questionings, and ascertained this and that, so that he said of himself jestingly, Lo, a river that floweth back unto its source, in many windings. For he wanted to learn what had taken place among men during the interval, whether they had become greater or smaller. And once, when he saw a row of new houses, he marvelled and said, What do these houses mean? 
Verily, no great soul put them up as its simile. Did perhaps a silly child take them out of its toy box? Would that another child put them again into the box? And these rooms and chambers, can men go out and in there? They seem to be made for silk dolls, or for dainty eaters, who perhaps let others eat with them. And Zarathustra stood still and meditated. At last he said sorrowfully, There hath everything become smaller. Everywhere do I see lower doorways. He who is of my type can still go there through, but he must stoop. Oh, when shall I arrive again at my home, where I shall no longer have to stoop, shall no longer have to stoop before the small ones? And Zarathustra sighed and gazed into the distance. The same day, however, he gave his discourse on the bedwarfing virtue. 2. I pass through this people and keep mine eyes open. They do not forgive me for not envying their virtues. They bite at me because I say unto them that for small people small virtues are necessary, and because it is hard for me to understand that small people are necessary. Here I am still a cock in a strange farmyard, at which even the hens peck. But on that account I am not unfriendly to the hens. I am courteous towards them, as towards all small annoyances. To be prickly towards what is small seemeth to me wisdom for hedgehogs. They all speak of me when they sit around their fire in the evening. They speak of me, but no one thinketh of me. This is the new stillness which I have experienced. Their noise around me spreadeth a mantle over my thoughts. They shout to one another, What is this gloomy cloud about to do to us? Let us see that it doth not bring a plague upon us. And recently did a woman seize upon her child that was coming unto me. Take the children away, cried she. Such eyes scorch children's souls. They cough when I speak. They think coughing an objection to strong winds. They divine nothing of the boisterousness of my happiness. We have not yet time for Zarathustra, so they object. But what matter about a time that hath no time for Zarathustra? And if they should altogether praise me, how could I go to sleep on their praise? A girdle of spines is their praise unto me. It scratches me even when I take it off. And this also did I learn among them. The praiser doeth as if he gave back. In truth, however, he wanteth more to be given him. Ask my foot if their lording and luring strains please it. Verily, to such measure and tick-tack, it liketh neither to dance nor to stand still. To small virtues would they fain lure and lord me. To the tick-tack of small happiness would they fain persuade my foot. I pass through this people and keep mine eyes open. They have become smaller, and ever become smaller. The reason thereof is their doctrine of happiness and virtue. For they are moderate also in virtue, because they want comfort. With comfort, however, moderate virtue only is compatible. To be sure, they also learn in their way to stride on and stride forward. That I call their hobbling. Thereby they become a hindrance to all who are in haste. And many of them go forward and look backwards thereby, with stiffened necks, those do are like to run up against. Foot and eye shall not lie, nor give the lie to each other. But there is much lying among small people. Some of them will, but most of them are willed. Some of them are genuine, but most of them are bad actors. There are actors without knowing it amongst them, and actors without intending it. The genuine ones are always rare, especially the genuine actors. Of man there is little here. Therefore do their women masculinize themselves. For only he who is man enough will save the woman in woman. And this hypocrisy found I worst amongst them, that even those who command feign the virtues of those who serve. I serve, thou servest, we serve, so chanteth here, 
even the hypocrisy of the rulers, and alas, if the first lord be only the first servant. Ah, even upon the hypocrisy did mine eyes curiosity alight, and well did I divine all their fly happiness and their buzzing around sunny window panes. So much kindness, so much weakness do I see, so much justice and pity, so much weakness. Round, fair, and considerate are they to one another, as grains of sand are round, fair, and considerate to grains of sand. Modestly to embrace a small happiness, that do they call submission, and at the same time they peer modestly after a new small happiness. In their hearts they want simply one thing most of all, that no one hurt them. Thus do they anticipate every one's wishes, and do well unto every one. That, however, is cowardice, though it be called virtue. And when they chance to speak harshly, those small people, then do I hear therein only their hoarseness. Every draught of air maketh them hoarse. Shrewd indeed are they. Their virtues have shrewd fingers. But they lack fists. Their fingers do not know how to creep behind fists. Virtue for them is what maketh modest and tame. Therewith have they made the wolf a dog, and man himself man's best domestic animal. We set our chair in the midst, so saith their smirking unto me, and as far from dying gladiators as from satisfied swine. That, however, is mediocrity, though it be called moderation. 3. I pass through this people, and let fall many words, but they know neither how to take, nor how to retain them. They wonder why I came not to revile venery and vice, and verily I came not to warn against pickpockets either. They wonder why I am not ready to abet and wet their wisdom, as if they had not yet enough of wiseacres, whose voices grate on mine ear like slate pencils. And when I call out, Curse all the cowardly devils in you, that would fain whimper and fold the hands and adore, then do they shout, Zarathustra is godless. And especially do their teachers of submission shout this, but precisely in their ears do I love to cry, Yea, I am Zarathustra the godless. Those teachers of submission, whether there is aught puny or sickly or scabby, there do they creep like lice, and only my disgust preventeth me from cracking them. Well, this is my sermon for their ears. I am Zarathustra the godless, who says, Who is more godless than I, that I may enjoy his teaching? I am Zarathustra the godless, where do I find mine equal? And all those are mine equals who give unto themselves their will, and divest themselves of all submission. I am Zarathustra the godless. I cook every chance in my pot, and only when it has been quite cooked do I welcome it as my food. And verily, many a chance came imperiously unto me, but still more imperiously did my will speak unto it. Then did it lie imploringly upon its knees, imploring that it might find home and heart with me, and saying flatteringly, See, O Zarathustra, how friend only cometh unto friend. But why talk I, when no one hath mine ears? And so will I shout it out unto all the winds. Ye ever become smaller, ye small people, ye crumble away, ye comfortable ones, ye will yet perish. By your many small virtues, by your many small emissions, and by your many small submissions, too tender, too yielding, so is your soil. But for a tree to become great, it seeketh to twine hard roots around hard rocks. Also what you omit weaveth at the web of all the human future. Even your naught is a cobweb, and a spider that liveth on the blood of the future. And when ye take, then it is like stealing, ye small virtuous ones, 
But even among knaves, honour says that one shall only steal when one cannot rob. It giveth itself, that is also a doctrine of submission. But I say unto you, ye comfortable ones, that it taketh to itself, and will ever take more and more from you. Ah, oh, that ye would renounce all half-willing, and would decide for idleness as ye decide for action. Ah, oh, that ye understood my word, do ever what ye will, but first be such as can will. Love ever your neighbour as yourselves, but first be such as love themselves. Such as love with great love, such as love with great contempt. Thus speaketh Zarathustra the godless. But why talk I, where no one hath mine ears? It is still an hour too early for me here. Mine own forerunner I am among this people, mine own cockrow in dark lanes. But their hour cometh, and there cometh also mine. Hourly do they become smaller, poorer, unfruitfuller. Poor herbs, poor earth. And soon shall they stand before me like dry grass and prairie, and verily weary of themselves, and panting for fire, more than for water. O blessed hour of the lightning, O mystery before noontide, running fires will I one day make of them, and heralds with flaming tongues. Herald shall they one day with flaming tongues. It cometh, it is nigh, the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part 49「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Jordan Schneider. Thus Spate Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common, Part 3, Chapter 50, On the Olive Mount. Winter, a bad guest, sitteth with me at home. Blue are my hands with his friendly handshaking. I honor him, that bad guest, but gladly leave him alone. Gladly do I run away from him, and when one runneth well, then one escapeth him. With warm feet and warm thoughts do I run where the wind is calm, to the sunny corner of mine olive mount. There do I laugh at my stern guest, and am still fond of him, because he cleareth my house of flies, and quieteth many noises. For he suffereth if, if not a gat waneth to buzz, or even two of them. Also the lanes maketh he lonesome, so that the midnight is afraid there is night. A hard guest is he, but I honor him, and do not worship, like the tenderlings, the pot-bellied fire idol. Better even a little teeth, chattering than idle adoration, so willeth my nature, and especially have I a grudge against all ardent, steaming, steamy fire idols. Him whom I love, I love better in winter than in summer. Better do I now mock at mine enemies, and more heartily when winter sitteth in my house. Heartily, verily, even when I creep into bed, there, still laugheth and wantoneth in my hidden happiness, even my deceptive dream laugheth. I, a creeper? Never in my life did I creep before the powerful, and if I ever lied, then I lie out of love. Therefore I am glad even in my winter bed. A poor bed maketh me more than a rich one, for I am jealous of my poverty, and in winter she is most faithful unto me. With a wickedness do I begin every day. I mock at the winter with a cold bath. On that account grumbleth my stern housemate. Also do I like to tickle him with a wax taper, that he may finally let the heavens emerge from the ashy gray twilight. For especially wicked am I in the morning at an early hour when the pail rattleth in the well, and horses neigh warmly in gray lanes. Impatiently do I then wait that clear sky may finally dawn for me, 
the snow-bearded winter sky, the hoary one, the whitehead. The winter sky, the silent winter sky, which often stifleth even the sun. Do I perhaps learn from it the long, clear silence? Or do it learn from me? Or hath each of us devised it himself? Of all good things the origin is a thousandfold. All good roguish things spring unto existence for joy. How could they always do, for once only? A good roguish thing is also the long silence, and to look like the winter sky out of a clear, round-eyed countenance. Like it to stifle one's sun and one's inflexible solar will. Verily, this art and this winter roguishness I have learnt well. My best loved wickedness and art is it. That is, my silence hath learned not to betray itself by silence. Clattering with diction and dice, I outwit so the solemn assistance. All those stern watchers shall my will and purpose elude. That no one might see down into my depth and into mine ultimate will. For that purpose did I devise lo the long, clear silence. Many a shrewd one did I find. He veiled his countenance and made his water muddy, that no one may might see there through and there under. But precisely unto him came the shrewder distrusters and nutcrackers. Precisely from him did they fish the best, concealed fish. But the clear, the honest, the transparent, these are for me the wisest silent ones. In them, so profound is the depth that even the clearest water doth not betray it. Thou snow-bearded, silent, winter sky, thou round-eyed, white head above me, oh, thou heavenly simile of my soul in its wantonness! And must I not conceal myself like one who hath swallowed gold, lest my soul should be ripped up? Must I not wear stilts, that they may overlook my long legs, all those enviers and injurers around me? Those dingy, fire-warmed, used-up, green-tinted, ill-natured shoals, how could their envy endure my happiness? Thus do I show them only the ice and winter of my peaks, and not that my mountain windeth all the solar girdles around it. They hear only the whistling of my winter storms, and know not that I also travel under warm seas, like longing, heavy, hot south winds. They commiserate also my accidents and chances, but my word saith, Suffer the chance to come unto me, innocent is it as a little child. How could they endure my happiness? if I did not put around it accidents and winter privations and bare skin caps and enmantling snowflakes, if I did not myself commiserate their pity, the pity of those enviers and injurers, if I did not myself sigh before them and chatter with cold and patiently let myself be swathed in their pity. This is the wise waggish will and good will of my soul, that it concealeth not its winters and glacial storms, it concealeth not its chill banes either. To one man, lonesomeness is the flight of the sick one. To another, it is the flight from the sick ones. Let them hear me chattering and sighing with winter cold, all those poor squinting knaves around me. With such sighing and chattering do I flee from their heated rooms. Let them sympathize with me and sigh with me on account of my chillblains. Quote, At the ice of knowledge will he yet freeze to death. Unquote. So they mourn. Meanwhile do I run with warm feet hither and thither on mine olive mount. In the sunny corner of my olive mount, olive mount do I sing and mock at all pity. Thus sang Zarathustra. End of part three, chapter fifty.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Jordan Schneider. Thus Spate Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common, Part 3, Chapter 51. On Passing By. Thus slowly wandering through many cities and drivers' cities, did Zarathustra return by round, about roads to his mountains and his cave. And behold, thereby he came he, unawares also to the gate of the great city. Here, however, a roaming fool, with extended hands, sprang toward him and stood in his way. It was the same fool whom the people called the Ape of Zarathustra. For he had learned from him something of the expression and modulation of language, and perhaps liked to borrow from the store of wisdom. And the fool talked thus to Zarathustra. O oh, Zarathustra, here is the great city, here thou hast nothing to seek and everything to lose. Why wouldst thou wade through this mire? Have pity on thy foot, spit rather on the gate of the city, and turn back. Here is the hell for anchorite's thoughts. Here are great so thoughts seethed alive and boiled small. Here do all great sentiments decay. Here may only rattle bone sensations rattle. Spellest thou not already the shambles and cook shops of the spirit? Steameth not this city with the fumes of slaughtered spirit? Seest thou not souls hanging like limp, dirty rags? And they make newspapers also out of these rags. Hearest thou not how spirit hath here become a verbal game? Loathsome verbal swill doth it vomit forth, and they make newspapers out of this verbal swill. They hound one another, and know not whither. They inflame one another, and know not why. They tinkle with their pinchbeck, they jingle with their gold. They are cold and seek warmth from distilled waters. They are inflamed and seek coolness from frozen spirits. They are all sick and sore through public opinion. All lusts and vices are here at home. But here there are also the virtuous. There is much appointable appointed virtue. Much appointable virtue with scribe fingers and hardly sitting flesh and waiting flesh, blessed with small breasts, stars, and padded haunchless daughters. There is here also much piety, and much faithful spittle-licking and spittle-backing before the God of hosts. From on high drippeth the star and the gracious spittle, for the high longeth every starless bosom. The moon hath its court, and the court hath its moon, calves. Unto all, however, that cometh from the court do the mendicant people pray, and all appointable mendicant virtues. I serve, thou servest, we serve. So prayeth all appointable virtue to the prince, that the merited star may at last stick on the slender breast. But the moon still resolveth around all that is earthly, so resolveth also the prince around what is earthliest of all. That, however, is the gold of the shopman. The god of the host of war is not the god of the golden bar. The prince prospereth, but the shopman disposeth. By all that is luminous and strong and good in thee, O Zarathustra, spit on the city of shopmen and return back. Here floweth all blood putridly and tepidly and frothily through all veins, split on the great city, which is a great slum where all the scum frotheth together. Spit on the city of compressed souls and slender breasts, of pointed eyes and sticky fingers, on the city of the obtrusive, the brazen face, the pen demagogues and tongue demagogues, the overheated ambitious, where everything maimed, ill-famed, lustful, untrustful, over-mellow, sticky yellow, and seditious, festereth pernicious. Spit on this great city and turn back. Here, however, did Zarathustra interrupt the foaming fool and shut his mouth. Stop this at once, called out Zarathustra. Long have thy speech and thy species disgusted me. Why didst thou live so long by the swamp? 
that thou hadst to become a frog and a toad. Floweth there not a tainted, frothy swamp blood in thine own veins, when thou hast learned to croak and revile? Why weanest thou not into the forest, or why didst thou not till the ground? Is the sea not full of green islands? I despise thy contempt, and when thou warnedest me, why did thou not warn thyself? Out of love alone shall my contempt and my warning bird take wing, but not out of the swamp. They call thee mine ape, thou foaming fool, but I call thee my grunting pig. By thy grunting thou spoilest even my praise of folly. What was it that first made thee grunt, because no one sufficiently flattered thee? Therefore didst thou seat thyself besides this filth, that thou mightest have cause for much grunting. Thou mightest have much vengeance, for vengeance, thou vain fool, is all thy foaming. I have divined thee well. But fools, word injureth me, even when thou art right. And if even Zarathustra's word were a hundred times justified, thou wouldst never do wrong with my word. Thus spate Zarathustra. Then he did look on the great city and sighed, and was long silent. At last he spake thus. I loathe also this great city, and not only this fool. Here and there, there is nothing better, nothing to worsen. Woe to this great city! And I would that I already saw the pillar of fire in which it will be consumed. For such pillars of fire must precede the great noontide. But this hath its time and its own fate. This precept, however, give I unto thee in parting, thou fool. Where one can go no longer, love, there should one pass by. Thus spake Zarathustra, and passed by the fool and the great city. End of part three, chapter fifty one. This is a LibriVox.org recording by J. C. Guan. This recording is in the public domain. Thus spake Zarahustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. Part three, chapter fifty two, The Apostates. Section 1 Ah, lieth everything already withered and grey, with but lately stood green and many-hued on this meadow. And how much honey of hope did I carry hence into my beehives! Those young hearts have already all become old, and not old even, only weary, ordinary, comfortable they declare it we have again become pious of late did i see them run forth at early morn with valorous steps but the feet of their knowledge became weary and now do they malign even their morning valour verily many of them once lifted their legs like the dancer to them winked the laughter of my wisdom. Then did they bethink themselves. Just now I have seen them bent down to creep to the cross. Around light and liberty did they once flutter like gnats and young poets. A little older, a little colder, and already are they mystifiers and mumblers and molly coddles. Did perhaps their hearts despond, because lonesomeness had swallowed me like a whale? Did their ear perhaps hearken yearningly, long for me in vain, and for my trumpet notes and herald calls? Ah, ever are there but few of those whose hearts have persistent courage and exuberance, and in such remaineth also the spirit patient. The rest, however, are cowardly. The rest, 
These are always the great majority. The commonplace, the superfluous, the far too many, those all are cowardly. Him who is of my type will also the experiences of my type meet on the way, so that his first companions must be corpses and buffoons. His second companions, however, they will call themselves his believers, will be a living host, with much love, much folly, much unbearded veneration. To those believers shall he who is of my type among men not bind his heart. In those springtimes and many-hued meadows shall he not believe, who knoweth the fickly faint-hearted human species. Could they do otherwise, then would they also will otherwise, the half and half spoil every whole. That leaves become withered, what is there to lament about that? Let them go, and fall away, O Zarahustra, and do not lament. Better even to blow amongst them with rustling winds. Blow among those leaves, O Zarahustra, that everything withered may run away from thee the faster. Section 2 We have again become pious so do those apostates confess. And some of them are still too pusillanimous thus to confess. Unto them I look into the eye, before them I say it unto their face, and unto the blush on their cheeks. Ye are those who again pray. It is, however, a shame to pray, not for all, but for thee, and me, and whoever hath his conscience in his head. For thee it is a shame to pray. Thou knowest it well, the faint-hearted devil in thee, which would fain fold its arms, and place its hands in its bosom, and take it easier. This faint-hearted devil persuaded thee that there is a God, Thereby, however, dost thou belong to the light-dreading type, to whom light never permitted repose. Now must thou daily thrust thy head deeper into obscurity and vapour. And, verily, thou choosest the hour well, for just now do the nocturnal birds again fly abroad. The hour hath come for all light-dreading people, the vesper hour and leisure hour, when they do not take leisure. I hear it and smell it, it hath come, their hour for hunt and procession, not indeed for a wild hunt, but for a tame, lame, snuffling, soft treaders, soft prayers hunt, for a hunt after susceptible simpletons. All mousetraps for the heart have again been set, and whenever I lift a curtain, a night moth rusheth out of it. Did it perhaps squat there along with another night moth? For everywhere do I smell small concealed communities, and wherever there are closets, there are new devotees therein and the atmosphere of devotees. They sit for long evenings beside one another, and say, Let us again become like little children, and say, Good God, ruined in mouths and stomachs by the pious confectioners. Or they look for long evenings at a crafty, lurking cross-spider that preaches prudence to the spiders themselves, and teacheth that, under crosses, it is good for cobweb spinning. Or they sit all day at swamps with angle rods, 
and on that account think themselves profound. But whoever fishes, where there are no fish, I do not even call him superficial. Or they learn in godly gay style to play the hop with a hymned poet, who would fain hop himself into the heart of young girls, for he had tired of old girls and their praises. Or they learn to shudder with a learned semi-madcap, who waiteth in darkened rooms for spirits to come to him, and the spirit runneth away entirely. Or they listen to an old roving howl and growl piper, who hath learned from the sad winds the sadness of sounds. Now pipeth he has the wind, and preacheth sadness in sad strains. And some of them have even become night watchmen. They know now how to blow horns, and go about at night, and awaken old things which have long fallen asleep. Five words about old things did I hear yesternight at the garden wall. They came from such old, sorrowful, arid night watchmen. For a father he careth not sufficiently for his children. Human fathers do this better. He is too old. He now careth no more for his children, answered the other night watchman. Hath he children? No one can prove it, unless he himself prove it. I have long wished that he would for once prove it thoroughly. Prove? As if he had ever proved anything. Proving is difficult to him. He layeth great stress on one's believing him. Ay, hey, hey, ay, belief saveth him. Belief in him, that is the way with old people. So it is with us also. Thus spake to each other the two old night watchmen and light scarers, and tooted thereupon sorrowfully on their horns. So did it happen yesternight at the garden wall. To me, however, did the heart writhe with laughter and was like to break. I knew not where to go, and sunk into the midriff. Verily, it will be my death yet, to choke with laughter when I see asses drunken, and hear night watchmen thus doubt about God. Hath the time not long since past for all such doubts? Who may nowadays awaken such old, slumbering, light shining things with the old deities hath it long since come to an end and verily a good joyful deity and had they they did not begloom themselves to death that do people fabricate on the contrary they laughed themselves to death once on a time that took place when the ungodliest utterance came from a god himself. The utterance, There is but one god, thou shalt have no other gods before me. An old grim beard of a god, a jealous one, forgot himself in such wise. And all the gods then laughed and shook upon their thrones and exclaimed, is it not just divinity that there are gods, but no god? He that hath an ear, let him hear. Thus talked Zarathustra in the city he loved, which he surnamed the Pied Cow. For from here he had but two days to travel to reach once more his cave and his animals. His soul, however, rejoiced unceasingly, on account of the nightness of his return home. End of Part 3, Section 52
This is a LibriVox.org recording by J. C. Guan. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3. Chapter 52. The Return Home. O oh, lonesomeness, my home, lonesomeness. Too long have I lived wildly in wild remoteness to return to thee without tears. Now threaten me with the finger as mothers threaten. Now smile upon me as mothers smile. Now say just, who was it? that like a whirlwind once rushed away from me, who, when departing, called out, Too long have I sat with lonesomeness, there have I unlearned silence. That hast thou learned now, surely? O Zarathustra, everything do I know, and that thou wert more forsaken amongst the many, thou unique one. Than thou ever wert with me. One thing is forsakenness, another matter is lonesomeness. That hast thou now learned, and that amongst men thou wilt ever be wild and strange. Wild and strange, even when they love thee, for above all. They want to be treated indulgently. Here, however, art thou at home, and house with thyself. Here canst thou utter everything, and unbosom all motives. Nothing is here ashamed of concealed, congealed feelings. Here do all things come caressingly to thy talk, and flatter thee for they want to ride upon thy back. On every smile dost thou here ride to every truth. Uprightly and openly mayest thou here talk to all things, and verily it soundeth as praise in their ears, for one to talk to all things directly. Another matter, however, is forsakenness, for dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thy bird screamed overhead, when thou stoodest in the forest, irresolute, ignorant where to go, beside the corpse, when thou speakest, let mine animals lead me, more dangerous have I found it among men than among animals, that was forsakenness. And dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thou satest in thine isle, a well of wine giving and granting amongst empty buckets, bestowing and disturbing amongst the thirsty, until at last thou alone satest thirsty among the drunken ones, and wailedst nightly, is taking not more blessed than giving, and stealing yet more blessed than taking, that was forsakenness. And dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thy silly hour came and drove thee forth from thyself, when with wicked whispering it said, Speak and succumb, when it disgusted thee with all thy waiting and silence, and discouraged thy humble courage, that was forsakenness. O oh, lonesomeness, my home, lonesomeness, how blessed and tenderly speaketh thy voice unto me. We do not question each other, we do not complain to each other, we go together openly through open doors. For all is open with thee and clear, and even the hours run here on lighter feet. For in the dark, 
time weighted heavier upon one than in the light. Here fly open unto me all beings' words and word cabinets. Here all being wanted to become words. Here all becoming wanted to learn of me how to talk. Down there, however, all talking is in vain. There, forgetting and passing by, are the best wisdom. That have I learned now. He who would understand everything in man must handle everything. But for that, I have two clean hands. I do not like even to inhale their breath. Alas, that I have lived so long among their nose and bad breaths. Oh, blessed stillness around me. Oh, pure odors around me. How from a deep breast this stillness fetches pure breath. How it hearkeneth this blessed stillness. But down there, there speaketh everything. There is everything misheard. If one announce one's wisdom with bells, the shopman in the market-place will out-jingle it with pennies. Everything among them talketh. No one knoweth any longer how to understand. Everything falleth into the water. Nothing falleth any longer into deep wells. Everything among them talketh. Nothing succeedeth any longer and accomplished itself. Everything crackled. But who will still sit quietly on the nest and hatch eggs? Everything among them talketh. Everything is out-talked. And that which yesterday was still too hard for time itself and its tooth, hang it to-day out-champed and out-chewed from the mouths of the men of to-day. Everything among them talketh, everything is betrayed, and what was once called the secret and secrecy of profound souls belongeth to-day to the street trumpeters and other butterflies. O oh, human hubbub, thou wonderful thing! Thou noise in dark streets. Now art thou again behind me. My greatest danger lieth behind me. In indulging and pitying lay ever my greatest danger. And all human hubbub wishes to be indulged and tolerated. With suppressed truths, with false hand and befalled heart, and rich in petty lies of pity, thus have I ever lived among men, disguised that I sit amongst them, ready to misjudge myself, that I might endure them, and willingly saying to myself, Thou fool, thou dost not know them. One unlearneth men, when one liveth amongst them, there is too much foreground in all men. What can far-seeing, far-longing eyes do there? And, fool that I was, when they misjudged me, I indulged them on that account more than myself, being habitually hard on myself, and often even taking revenge on myself for the indulgence. Stung all over by poisonous flies, And hollowed like the stone by many drops of wickedness. Thus did I sit among them, And still said to myself, Innocent is everything petty of its pettiness. Especially did I find those who call themselves the good, The most poisonous flies. They sting, in all innocence, they lie in all innocence. 
how could they be just toward me? He who liveth amongst the good, pity teacheth him to lie. Pity maketh stifling air for all free souls, for the stupidity of the good is unfathomable. To conceal myself and my riches, that did I learn down there. For every one did I still find poor in spirit. It was the lie of my pity that I knew in every one, that I saw and scented in every one what was enough of spirit for him, and what was too much. They're stiff, wise men. I call them wise, not stiff. Thus did I learn to slur over words. The grave diggers dig for themselves diseases. Under old rubbish rest bad vapors. One should not stir up the marsh. One should live on mountains. With blessed nostrils do I again breathe mountain freedom. Free at last is my nose from the smell of all human hubbub. With the sharp breezes tickled, as with sparkling wine, sneezeth my soul, sneezeth and shouteth self-congratulatingly, Health to thee! Thus spake Zarathustra. End of Part 3 Chapter 53This is a LibriVox.org recording by J. C. Guan. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. Part 3, Chapter 54 The Three Evil Things Part 1 In my dream, in my last morning dream, I stood to-day on a promontory, beyond the world. I hailed a pair of scales, and weighed the world. Alas, that the rosy dawn came too early to me. She glowed me awake, the jealous one. Jealous is she always of the glows of my morning dream. Measurable by him who has time, weighable by a good weigher, attainable by strong pinions, divinable by divine nutcrackers. Thus did my dream find the world. My dream, a bold sailor, half ship, half hurricane, silent as the butterfly, impatient as the falcon. How had it the patience and leisure to-day for world weighing? Did my wisdom, perhaps, speak secretly to it? My laughing, wide-awake day wisdom, which mocketh all the infinite worlds, for it saith, where forces, there becometh number the master, it hath more force. How confidently did my dream contemplate this finite world, not new-fangledly, not old-fangledly, not timidly, not entreatingly. As if a big round apple presented itself to my hand, a ripe golden apple with a coolly soft velvety skin, thus did the world present itself unto me. As if a tree nodded unto me, a broad-branched, strong-willed tree, curved as a recline, and a footstool for weary travellers. Thus did the world stand on my promontory, as if delicate hands carried a casket towards me, a casket open for the delectation of modest, adoring eyes. Thus did the world present itself before me to-day. 
not riddle enough to scare human love from it, not solution enough to put to sleep human wisdom. A humanly good thing was the world to me to-day, of which such bad things are said. How I thank my morning dream that I thus at to-day's dawn weighed the world, as a humanly good thing did it come unto me, this dream and hard comforter, and that I may do the like by day, and imitate and copy its best. Now will I put the three worst things on the scales, and weigh them humanly well. He who taught to bless, taught also to curse. What are the three best cursed things in the world? These will I put on the scales. Voluptuousness, passion for power, and selfishness. These three things have hitherto been best cursed, and have been in worst and falsest repute. These three things will I weigh humanly well. Well, here is my promontory, and there is the sea. It rolleth hither unto me, shaggily and fawningly, the old, faithful, hundred-headed dog-monster that I love. Well, here will I hold the scales over the weltering sea, and also a witness do I choose to look on. Thee, the anchorite tree, Thee, the strong-odored, broad-arched tree that I love. On what bridge goeth the now to the hereafter? By what constraint doth the high stoop to the low? And what enjoineth even the highest still to grow upwards? Now stand the scales, poised and at rest. Three heavy questions have I thrown in. Three heavy answers carrieth the other scale. Part Two Voluptuousness Unto all hair-shirted despisers of the body, a sting and stake, and cursed as the world by all backworlds men, for it mocketh and befalls all erring, misinfering teachers. Voluptuousness to the rabble, the slow fire at which it is burnt, to all wormy wood, to all stinking rags, the prepared heat and stew furnace. Voluptuousness, to free hearts, a thing innocent and free, the garden happiness of the earth, all the future's thanks overflow to the present. Voluptuousness, only to the withered and sweet poison, to the lion willed, however, the great cordial and the reverently saved wine of wines. Voluptuousness, the great symbolic happiness of a higher happiness and highest hope, for to many is marriage promised, and more than marriage. To many that are more unknown to each other than man and woman, and who hath fully understood how unknown to each other are man and woman. Voluptuousness, but I will have hedges around my thoughts, and even around my words, lest swine and libertine should break into my gardens. Passion for Power the glowing scourge of the hardest of the heart-hard. The cruel torture reserved for the cruelest themselves, the gloomy flame of living pious. Passion for power, the wicked gadfly, which is mounted on the vainest peoples, the scorner of all uncertain virtue, which rideth on every horse and on every pride. Passion for power, 
the earthquake, which breaketh and upbreaketh all that is rotten and hollow, the rolling, rumbling, punitive demolisher of whited sepulchres, the flashing interrogative sun behind premature answers. Passion for power, before whose glance man creepeth and croucheth and drudgeth and becometh lower than the serpent and the swine. Until at last great contempt cried out of him. Passion for power, the terrible teacher of great contempt, which preaches to their face to cities and empires, away with thee, until a voice crieth out of themselves, away with me. Passion for power, which, however, mounteth alluringly even to the pure and lonesome, and up to self-satisfied elevations, glowing like a love that painteth purple felicities alluring on earthly heavens. Passion for power. But who would call it passion when the height longeth to stoop for power? Verily, nothing sick or diseased is there in such longing and descending. That the lonesome height may not for ever remain lonesome and self-sufficing, that the mountains may come to the valleys and the winds of the heights to the plains. Oh, who could find the right prenomen and honouring name for such longing? Bestowing virtue, thus did Zarathustra once name the unnameable. And then it happened also, and verily it happened for the first time, that his word blessed selfishness, the wholesome, healthy selfishness that springeth from the powerful soul. From the powerful soul to which the high body appertaineth, the handsome, triumphing, refreshing body around which everything becometh a mirror, the pliant, persuasive body, the denser, whose symbol and epitome is the self-enjoying soul. Of such bodies and souls, the self-enjoyment calls itself virtue. With its words of good and bad doth such self-enjoyment shelter itself as with sacred groves. With the names of its happiness doth it banish from itself everything contemptible, Away from itself doth it banish everything cowardly. It saith, Bad, that is cowardly. Contemptible seem to it the ever solicitous, the sighing, the complaining, and whoever pick up the most trifling advantage. It despiseth also all bittersweet wisdom. For verily, there is also wisdom that bloometh in the dark, a nightshade wisdom, which ever sighs, all is vain. Shy distrust is regarded by it as a base, and every one who wanteth oaths instead of looks and hands, also all over distrustful wisdom, for such is the mode of cowardly souls. Baser still, it regardeth the obsequious, doggish one, who immediately lieth on his back, the submissive one. And there is also wisdom in that submissive and doggish and pious and obsequious, hateful to it altogether, and the loathing, is he who will never defend himself, he who swalloweth down poisonous spittle, and bad looks, the all too patient one, the all endurer, the all satisfied one, for that is the mode of slaves. Whether they be servile before gods and divine spurnings, or before men and stupid human opinions, 
at all kinds of slaves doth it spit, this blessed selfishness. Bad, thus doth it call all that its spirit broke in, and sordidly servile, constrained, blinking eyes, depressed hearts, and the false submissive style, which kisseth with broad cowardly lips and spurious wisdom. So doth it call all the wit that slaves and hoary-headed and weary ones affect, and especially all the cunning, spurious-witted, curious-witted foolishness of priests. The spurious wise, however, all the priests, the world-weary, and those whose souls are of feminine and servile nature, Oh, how hath their game all along abused selfishness? And precisely, that was to be virtue, and was to be called virtue, to abuse selfishness. And selfless, so did they wish themselves with good reason, all those world-weary cowards and cross-bitters. But to all those cometh now the day, the change, the sword of judgment, the great noontide. Then shall many things be revealed. And he who proclaimed the ego wholesome and holy, and selfishness blessed, verily, he, the prognosticator, speaketh also what he knoweth. Behold, it cometh, it is nigh, the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of Part 3, Chapter 54「This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Shim and Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 3, Chapter 55 The Spirit of Gravity 1. My mouthpiece is of the people. Too coarsely and cordially do I talk for Angora rabbits. And still stranger soundeth my words unto all inkfish and pen foxes. My hand is a fool's hand. Woe unto all tables and walls, and whatever hath room for a fool's sketching, fool's scrawling. My foot is a horse foot. Therewith do I trample and trot over stick and stone, in the fields up and down, and am bedeviled with a delight in all fast racing. My stomach is surely an eagle's stomach, for it prefereth lamb's flesh. Certainly it is a bird's stomach, nourished with innocent things, and with few, ready and impatient to fly away. Now that is my nature. Why should there not be something of bird nature therein? And especially that I am hostile to the spirit of gravity. That is bird nature. Verily, deadly hostile, supremely hostile, originally hostile. O oh, whither hath my hostility not flown and misflown? Thereof could I sing a song, and will sing it, though I be alone in an empty house, and must sing it to my own ears. Other singers there are, to be sure, to whom only the full house maketh the voice soft, the hand eloquent, the eye expressive, the heart wakeful, those do I not resemble. 2. He who one day teacheth men to fly will have shifted all landmarks. To him will all landmarks themselves fly into the air. The earth will he christen anew as the light body. The ostrich runneth faster than the fastest horse, but it also thrusteth its head heavily into the heavy earth. Thus it is with men who cannot yet fly. Heavy unto him are earth and life, and so willeth the spirit of gravity. But he who would become light, and be a bird, 
must love himself. Thus do I teach. Not, to be sure, with the love of the sick and infected, for with them stinketh even self-love. One must learn to love oneself, thus do I teach, with a wholesome and healthy love, that one may endure to be with oneself, and not go roving about. Such roving about christen itself brotherly love. With these words hath there hitherto been the best lying and dissembling, and especially by those who have become burdensome to every one. And verily, it is no commandment for today and tomorrow to learn to love oneself. Rather, it is of all arts the finest, subtlest, last, and most patient. For to its possessor is all possessions well concealed, and of all treasure pits one's own is last excavated, so causeth the spirit of gravity. Almost in the cradle we are apportioned with heavy words and worths. Good and evil, so calleth itself this dowry. For the sake of it we are forgiven for living. And therefore suffereth one little children to come unto one, to forbid them betimes to love themselves. So causeth the spirit of gravity. And we, we bear loyally what is apportioned unto us, on hard shoulders over rugged mountains. And when we sweat, then do people say to us, Yea, life is hard to bear. But man himself only is hard to bear. The reason thereof is that he carrieth too many extraneous things on his shoulders. Like the camel kneeleth he down, and letteth himself be well laden. Especially the strong load-bearing man, in whom reverence resideth. Too many extraneous heavy words and worths loaded he upon himself, then seemeth life to him a desert. And verily, many a thing also that is our own is hard to bear, and many internal things in man are like the oyster, repulsive and slippery and hard to grasp. And so an elegant shell with elegant adornment, must plead for them. But this art also one must learn, to have a shell, and a fine appearance, and a sagacious blindness. Again, it deceiveth about many things in men, that many a shell is poor, and pitiable, and too much of a shell. Many concealeth goodness, and power is never dreamed of. The choicest dainties find no tasters. Women know that the choicest of them, a little fatter, a little leaner, oh, how much fate is in so little! Man is difficult to discover, and unto himself most difficult of all, often lieth the spirit concerning the soul, so causeth the spirit of gravity. He, however, hath discovered himself who saith, This is my good and evil. Therewith hath he silenced the mole and the dwarf, who saith, Good for all, evil for all. Verily neither do I like those who call everything good, and this world the best of all. Those do I call the all-satisfied. All-satisfiedness, which knoweth how to taste everything, that is not the best taste. I honour the refractory, fastidious tongues, and stomachs, which hath learned to say I and yea, and nay. To cheweth and digest everything, however, that is genuine swine nature. Ever to say yea, that hath only the ass learnt, and those like it. Deep yellow and hot red, so wanteth my taste, it mixeth blood with all colours. He, however, who whitewasheth his house, betrayeth unto me a white-washed soul. With mummies some fall in love, others with phantoms, both alike hostile to all flesh and blood. Oh, how repugnant are both to my taste! For I love blood. And there will not I reside and abide, where every one spitteth and speweth. That is now my taste, 
rather I would live among the thieves and perjurers. Nobody carrieth gold in his mouth. Still more repugnant to me, however, are all lick spittles, and the most repugnant animal of man that I have found did I christen parasite. It would not love, and would yet live by love. Unhappily do I call all those who have only one choice, either to become evil beasts or evil beast tamers. Among such would I not build my tabernacle. Unhappy do I call those who have ever to wait. They are repugnant to my taste. All toll gatherers and traders and kings and other landskeepers and shopkeepers. Verily, I learn waiting also, and thoroughly so, but only waiting for myself. And above all that I learn standing and walking and running and leaping and climbing and dancing. This, however, is my teaching. He who wisheth to one day to fly must first learn standing and walking and running and climbing and dancing. One doth not fly into flying. With rope ladders learn I to reach many a window. With nimble legs do I climb high masts. To sit on high masts of perception seemed to me no small bliss. To flicker like small flames on high masts, a small light, certainly, but a great comfort to cast away sailors and shipwrecked ones. By diverse ways and wendings did I arrive at my truth. Not by one ladder did I mount to the height where mine eye roveth to my remoteness. And unwillingly did I ask my way. That was always counter to my taste. Rather did I question and test the ways themselves. A testing and a questioning hath been all my travelling. And verily, one must also learn to answer such questioning. That, however, is my taste. Neither a good nor a bad taste, but my taste of which I no longer have either shame nor secrecy. This is now my way. Where is yours? Thus did I answer those who ask me the way. For thee way, it doth not exist. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part three, chapter 55, The Spirit of Gravity. Read and recorded by Tim Sherman Chase, April 2008. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3, Chapter 56. Old and New Tables 1. Here do I sit and wait, old broken tables around me, and also new half-written tables. When cometh mine hour? The hour of my descent, of my down-going, for once more will I go unto men. For that hour do I now wait. For first must the signs come unto me that it is mine hour, namely, the laughing lion with a flock of doves. Meanwhile do I talk to myself as one who hath time. No one telleth me anything new, so I telleth myself my own story. 2. When I came unto men, then I found them resting on an old infatuation, all of them thought they had long known what was good and bad for men. An old wearisome business seemed to them all discourse about virtue. And he who wished to sleep well spoke of good and bad ere retiring to rest. This solemnness I did disturb when I taught that no one yet knoweth what is good and bad, unless it be the creating one. It is he, however, who createth man's goal, and giveth to the earth its meaning and its future. 
he only affecteth it that aught is good or bad. And I bade them upset their old academic chairs, and wherever that old infatuation sat, I bade them laugh at their great moralists, their saints, their poets, and their saviours. At their gloomy sages did I bid them laugh, and whoever hath sat admonishingly as a black scarecrow on the tree of life. On their great grave highway did I seat myself, and even beside the carrion and vultures, and I laughed at all their bygone and its mellow decaying glory. Verily, like the penitential preachers and fools, did I cry wrath and shame on all their greatness and smallness. Oh, that their vest is so very small! Oh, that their worst is so very small! Thus did I laugh. Thus did my wise longing, born in the mountains, cry and laugh in me, a wild wisdom, verily, my great pinion-rustling longing. And oft did it carry me off, and up, and away, and in the midst of laughter, then flew I quivering like an arrow, with sun-intoxicated rapture, out into distant futures, which no dream hath yet seen into warmer souls than ever sculptor conceived, where gods in their dancing are ashamed of all clothes, paren, that I may speak in parables, and halt and stammer, like the poets, and verily I am ashamed that I have still to be a poet, in paren, where all becoming seem to me dancing of gods, and the wantoning of gods, and the world unloosed and unbridled, and fleeing back to itself, as an eternal self-fleeing, and re-seeking of one another of many gods, as the blessing of self-contradiction, re-commuting and re of one another of many gods, where all time seemed to me a blessed mockery of moments, when necessity of freedom itself, which played happily with the gold of freedom, where I also found again my old devil and arch-enemy, the spirit of gravity, and all that it created, constraint, law, necessity and consequence, and purpose, and will, and good, and evil. For must there not be that which is danced over, danced beyond? Must there not, for the sake of the nimble, the nimblest, be moles, and clumsy dwarves? 3. There was it also where I picked up from the path the word superman, and that man is something that must be surpassed, that man is a bridge and not a goal, rejoicing over his noontides and evenings as advances to new rosy dawns. The Zarathustra word of the great noontide, and whatever else I have hung up over men like purple evening afterglows, Verily, also, new stars did I make them see, along with new nights, and over cloud and day and night did I spread out laughter like gay-coloured canopy. I taught them that all my poetization and aspiration, to compose and to collect into unity what is fragment in men, and riddle and fearful chance. As composer, riddle-reader, and redeemer of chance did I teach them to create the future, and all that hath been, to redeem by creating. The past of men to redeem, and every it was, to transform, until the will saith, But so did I will it, so shall I will it. This did I call redemption, this alone taught I them to call redemption. Now do I await my redemption, that I may go down unto them for the last time. For once more will I go unto men, Amongst them will my sun set, in my dying I will give them my choicest gift. From the sun did I learn this, when it goeth down, the exuberant one, gold doth it then pour into the sea, out of inexhaustible riches, so that the poorest fisherman roweth even with golden oars. For this did I once see, and did not tire of weeping in beholding it. Like the sun will also Zarathustra go down, now sitting he here, and waiteth. Old broken tables around him, and also new tables, half-written. 4. Behold, 
here is a new table. But where are my brethren who will carry it with me to the valley, and into the hearts of flesh? Thus demandeth my great love to the remotest ones. Be not considerate of thy neighbour. Man is something that must be surpassed. There are many diverse ways and modes of surpassing. See thou thereto. But only a buffoon thinketh. Man can also be overlapped. Surpass thyself even in thy neighbour. And a right which thou canst seize upon, shalt thou not allow to be given thee. What thou doest can no one do to thee again. Lo, there is no requital. He who cannot command himself shall obey. And many a one can command himself, but sorely lacketh self-obedience. 5. Thus wisheth the type of noble souls. They desire to have nothing gratuitously, least of all life. He who is of the populace wisheth to live gratuitously. We others, however, to whom life hath given itself, we are ever considering what we can best give in return. And verily, it is a noble dictum which saith, What life promiseth us? That promise will we keep to life. One should not wish enjoyment where one doth not contribute to the enjoyment. And one should not wish to enjoy. For enjoyment and innocence are the most bashful things, neither likes to be sought for. One should have them, but one should rather seek for guilt and pain. 6. O oh, my brethren, he who is the firstling is ever sacrificed. Now, however, we are firstlings. We all bleed on secret sacrificial altars. We all burn and broil in honour of ancient idols. Our best is still young. This exciteth old palates. Our flesh is tender, our skin is only lamb's skin. How could we not excite old idol priests? In ourselves dwelleth he still, the old idol priest who broileth our best for his banquet. Ah, my brethren, how could firstlings fail to be sacrifices? But so wisheth our type, and I love those who do not wish to preserve themselves, the down-going ones do I love with mine entire love, for they go beyond. 7. To be true, that can few be, and he who can will not. Least of all, however, can the good be true. O oh, these good ones! Good men never speak the truth, for the spirit thus to be good is a malady. They yield, those good ones, they submit themselves. Their heart repeateth, their soul obeyeth. He, however, who obeyeth, doth not listen to himself. All that is called evil by the good must come together in order that one truth may be born. O oh, my brethren, are ye also evil enough for this truth? The daring adventure, the prolonged distrust, the cruel nay, the tedium, the cutting into the quick, how seldom do these come together? Out of such seed, however, is truth produced. Beside the bad conscience hath hitherto grown all knowledge. Break up, break up, ye discerning ones, the old tables. 8. When the water hath planks, when gangways and railings o'erspan the stream, Verily, he is not believed who saith, All is in flux. But even the simpletons contradict him. What? say the simpletons. All is in flux? Planks and railings are still over the stream. Over the stream all is stable. All the values of things, bridges and bearings, all good and evil, these are all stable. Cometh, however, the hard winter, the stream tamer. Then learn even the wittiest distrust, and verily, not only the simpletons then say, Should not everything stand still? 
fundamentally standeth everything still. That is an appropriate winter doctrine, good cheer for an unproductive period, a great comfort for winter sleepers and fireside lodgers. Fundamentally standeth everything still. But contrary thereto preacheth the thawing wind. The thawing wind, a bullock which is no ploughing bullock, a furious bullock, a destroyer, which with angry horns breaketh the ice. The ice, however, breaketh gangways. O oh, my brethren, is not everything at present in flux? Have not all railings and gangways fallen into the water? Who would still hold on to good and evil? Woe to us! Hail to us! The thawing wind bloweth! Thus preacheth my brethren all through the streets. 9. There is an old illusion. It is called good and evil. Around soothsayers and astrologers hath hitherto revolved in orbit of this illusion. Once did one believe in soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore did one believe everything is fate, thou shalt, for thou must. Then again one did distrust all soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore one did believe everything is freedom, thou canst, for thou willest. O oh, my brethren, concerning the stars and the future, there hath hitherto only been illusion, and not knowledge, and therefore, concerning good and evil, there hath hitherto only been illusion, and not knowledge. 10. Thou shalt not rob, thou shalt not slay. Such precepts were once called holy, before them did one bow the knee and the head, and took off one's shoes. But I ask you, where hath there ever been better robbers and slayers in the world than such holy precepts? Is there not even in all life robbing and slaying? For such precepts to be called holy, was not truth itself thereby slain? Or was it a sermon of death, that called holy what contradicted and dissuaded from life. O oh, my brethren, break up, break up for me the old tables. 11. It is my sympathy with all the past that I see it is abandoned, abandoned to the favour, the spirit, and the madness of every generation that cometh, and reinterpreteth all that has been as its bridge. A great potentate might arise, an artful prodigy, who with approval and disapproval could strain and constrain all the past, until it became for him a bridge, a harbinger, a herald, and a cockcrowing. This, however, is the other danger, and mine other sympathy. He who is of the populace, his thoughts go ever back to his grandfather, and with his grandfather, however, doth time cease. Thus is all the past abandoned. For it might some day happen for the populace to become master, and drown all time in shallow waters. Therefore, O oh my brethren, a new nobility is needed, which shall be the adversary of all populace and potentate rule, and shall inscribe anew the word noble on new tables. For many noble ones are needed, and many kinds of noble ones, for a new nobility. Or, as one said in a parable, that is just divinity, that there are gods, but no god. 12. O oh, my brethren, I consecrate you and point you to a new nobility. Ye shall become procreators and cultivators and sowers of the future. Verily not to a nobility which ye could purchase like traders with traders' gold, for little worth is all that hath its price. Let it not be your honour henceforth whence ye come, but whither ye go. Your will and your feet, which seek to surpass you, let those be your new honour. Verily, not that ye have served a prince, of what account a prince is now. 
nor that ye have become a bulwark to that which standeth, that it may stand more firmly, not that your family have become courtly at courts, and that ye have learned, gay-coloured like flamingoes, to stand long hours in shallow pools. Paren, for the ability to stand is the merit of courtiers, and all courtiers believe that unto blessedness after death pertaineth permission to sit. End paren. Nor even that a spirit called holy led your forefathers into promised lands, which I did not praise. For where the worst of all trees grew, the cross, in the land where there is nothing to praise. And verily, wherever this holy spirit led its knights, always in such campaigns did goats and geese and rye heads and guy heads run foremost. O oh, my brethren, not backward shall your nobility gaze, but outward. Exiles shall ye be from all fatherlands and forefatherlands. Your children's land shall ye love. Let this love be your new nobility, the undiscovered in the remotest seas. For it do I bid your sail search and search. Unto your children shall ye make amends for being the children of your fathers. All the past shall ye thus redeem. This new table do I place over you. 13. Why should one live? All is vain. To live, that is to thrash straw. To live, that is to burn oneself and not get warm. Such ancient babbling still passeth for wisdom. Because it is old, however, and smelleth mustily, therefore it is the more honoured. Even mould ennobleth. Children might thus speak. They shun the fire, because it hath burned them. There is much childishness in the old books of wisdom. And he who ever thrasheth straw, why should he be allowed to rail at thrashing? Such a fool one would have to muzzle. Such persons sit down to the table and bring nothing with them, not even good hunger, and then do they rail, all is vain. But to eat and drink well, my brethren, is verily no vain art. Break up, break up for me the tables of the never joyous ones. 14. To the clean all things are clean, thus say the people. I, however, say unto you, to the swine all things become swinish. Therefore preacheth the visionaries and bowed heads, paren, whose hearts are also bowed down, end paren. The world itself is a filthy monster, for these are all unclean spirits, especially those, however, who have no peace or rest unless they see the world from the backside, the back world's men. To those do I say it to the face, though it sound unpleasantly, the world resembleth man, in that it hath a backside. So much is true. There is in the world much filth, so much is true. But the world itself is not therefore a filthy monster. There is wisdom in the fact that much in the world smelleth badly, loathing itself createth wings, and fountain divining powers. In the best there is still something to loathe, and in the best there is still something that must be surpassed. O oh, my brethren, there is much wisdom in the fact that much filth is in the world. 15. Such sayings did I hear pious backworlds men speak to their consciences, and verily without a wickedness or guile, although there is nothing more guileful in the world, or more wicked. Let the world be as it is, raise not a finger against it. Let whoever will choke and stab and skin and scrape the people, raise not a finger against it, thereby we will learn to renounce the world. And thy own reason, this shalt thou thyself stifle and choke, for it is a reason of this world. Thereby wilt thou learn thyself to renounce the world. Shatter, shatter, O my brethren, those old tables of the pious. Tatter the maxims of the world maligners. 
16. He who learneth much unlearneth all violent cravings. That do people now whisper to one another in all the dark lanes. Wisdom wearieth, nothing is worth while, thou shalt not crave. This new table found I hanging even in the public markets. Break up for me, O my brethren, break up also that new table. The weary, O the world, put it up, and the preachers of death, and the jailer. For lo, it is also a sermon for slavery. Because they learn badly and not the best, and everything too early and everything too fast, because they ate badly, for thence hath returneth their ruined stomach. For a ruined stomach is their spirit, it persuadeth to death. For verily, my brethren, the spirit is a stomach. Life is a well of delight, but to him in whom the ruined stomach speaketh, the father of affliction, all fountains are poisoned. To discern, that is delight to the lion willed, but he who hath become weary of himself merely willed, with him play all the waves. And such is always the nature of weak men, they lose themselves on their way. And at last asketh the weariest, Why did we ever go on the way? All is indifferent. To them soundeth it pleasant to have preached in their ears, Nothing is worth while, thou shalt not will. That, however, is a sermon for slavery. O oh, my brethren, a fresh blustering wind cometh Zarathustra unto all way-weary ones. Many noses will he yet make sneeze. Even through wolves bloweth my free breath, and into prisons and imprisoned spirits. Willing emancipateth, for willing is creating, so do I teach and only for creating shall ye learn. And also learning shall ye learn only from me, the learning well. He who hath ears, let him hear. 17. There standeth the boat, thither it go over, perhaps into a vast nothingness. But who willeth enter into this perhaps? None of you want to enter into the death-boat. How should ye then be world-weary ones? World-weary ones. And have not even withdrawn from the earth. Eager did I find you for the earth, amorous still for your own world-weariness. Not in vain doth your lip hang down, a small worldly wish still sit thereon, and in your eye. Floateth there not a cloudlet, of unforgotten earthly bliss. There are on earth many good inventions, some useful, some pleasant, for their sake is the earth to be loved. And many such good inventions there are, that they are like women's breasts, useful at the same time, and pleasant. Ye world-weary ones, however, ye earth-idlers, you shall one beat with stripes, with stripes shall one again make you sprightly limbs. For if ye not be invalids, or decrepit creatures, of whom the earth is weary, then ye are sly sloths, or dainty, sneaking pleasure cats. And if ye will not again run gaily, then shall ye pass away. To the incurable shall one not seek to be a physician, thus teacheth the Zarathustra, so shall ye pass away. But more courage is needed to make an end than to make new verse, that do all physicians and poets know well. 18. O oh, my brethren, there are tables which weariness framed, and tables which slothfulness framed, corrupt slothfulness. Although they speak similarly, they want to be heard differently. See this languishing one, only a span breadth is he from his goal, but from weariness hath he lain down obstinately in the dust, this brave one. From weariness yawneth he at the path, at the earth, at the goal, and at himself. Not a step further will he go, this brave one. 
Now goeth the sun upon him, and the dogs lick at his sweat, but he lieth there in his obstinacy, and prefereth to languish, a span breadth from his goal to languish. Verily, ye will have to drag him into his heaven by the hair of his head, this hero. Better still that ye let him lie where he hath lain down, that sleep may come unto him, the comforter, with cool pattering rain. Let him lie, until of his own accord he awakeneth, until his own accord he repudiate all weariness, and what weariness hath taught through him. Only, my brethren, see that ye scare the dogs away from him, the idle skulkers, and all swarming vermin, all the swarming vermin of the cultured, that feast on the sweat of every hero. 19. I form circles around me in holy boundaries. Ever fewer ascend with me ever higher mountains. I build mountain ranges out of ever holier mountains. But wherever ye would ascend with me, O my brethren, take care lest a parasite ascend with you. A parasite, that is a reptile, a creeping, cringing reptile, that trieth to fatten on your infirm and sore places. And this is its art. It divineth where ascending souls weary. In your trouble and dejection, in your sensitive modesty, doth it build its loathsome nest. Where the strong are weak, where the noble are all too gentle, there buildeth its loathsome nest, the parasite liveth, where the great have small sore places. Where is the highest of all species of being? And what is the lowest? The parasite is the lowest species. He, however, who is of the highest species, feedeth most parasites. For the soul which hath the longest ladder, and can go deepest down, how could there fail to be the most parasites upon it? The most comprehensive soul, which can run and stray, and rove furthest in itself, the most necessary soul, which out of joy flingeth itself into chance, the soul in being, which plungeth into becoming, the possessing soul, which seeketh to attain desire and longing, the soul fleeth from itself, from overtaking itself in the widest circuit, the wisest soul, unto which folly speaketh most sweetly, the soul most self-loving, in which all things have their current and counter-current, their ebb and their flow. Oh, how could the loftiest soul fail to have the worst parasites? 20. O oh, my brethren, am I then cruel? But I say, what falleth, that shall one also push. Everything of today, it falleth, it decayeth. Who would preserve it? But I, I wish also to push it. Know ye the delight which rolleth stones into precipitous depths? Those men of today, just see how they roll into my depths. A prelude am I to better players, O oh my brethren, an example. Do according to my example. And him who ye do not teach to fly, teach, I pray you, to fall faster. 21. I love the brave, but it is not enough to be a swordsman. One must also know whereon to use swordsmanship. And often it is greater bravery to keep quiet and pass by, than thereby one may reserve oneself for a worthier foe. You shall only have foes to be hated, but not foes to be despised. You must be proud of your foes, thus I have already taught. For the worthy foe, O oh my brethren, ye shall reserve yourselves. Therefore must ye pass by many a one, especially many of the rabble, who din your ears with noise about people and peoples. Keep your eye clear of their for and against. There is there much right, much wrong. He you look upon become wroth. There in viewing, there in viewing, they are the same thing. Therefore depart into the forests, and lay your sword to sleep. 
go your ways, and let the people and peoples go theirs, gloomy ways, verily, on which not a single hope glinteth any more. Let there the trader rule, where all that still glittereth is, trader's gold. It is the time of kings no longer. That which now calleth itself the people is unworthy of kings. See how these people themselves now do just like the traders. They pick up the smallest advantage out of all kinds of rubbish. They lay lures for one another. They lure things out of one another. That they call good neighborliness. O oh, blessed remote period, when a people said to itself, I will be master over peoples. For my brethren, the best to rule, the best also willeth to rule. And where the teaching is different, there the best is lacking. 22. If they had bread for nothing, alas, for what would they cry? Their maintainment, that is their true entertainment, and they shall have it hard. Beasts of prey are they, in their working, there is even plundering, in their earning, there is even overreaching, therefore they shall have it hard. Better beasts of prey shall they become, subtler, cleverer, more man-like, for man is the best beast of prey. All the animals hath man already robbed of their virtues, that is why, of all animals, it hath been hardest for man. Only the birds are still beyond him, and if man should yet learn to fly, alas, to what height would his rapacity fly? 23. Thus would I have man and woman, fit for war the one, fit for modernity the other, both, however, fit for dancing with head and legs. And lost be the day to us in which a measure hath not been danced, and false be every truth which hath not laughter along with it. 24. Your marriage arranging, see that it be not a bad arranging. Ye have arranged too hastily, so there followeth therefrom marriage breaking, and better marriage breaking than marriage bending. Marriage lying. Thus spake a woman unto me. Indeed, I broke the marriage, but first did the marriage break me. The badly paired found I ever the most vengeful. They make every one suffer for it, that they no longer run singly. On that account I want the honest ones to say to one another, We love each other. Let us see to it that we maintain our love. Or shall our pledging be blundering? Give us a set term and a small marriage, that we may see if we are fit for the great marriage. It is a great matter always to be twain. Thus do I counsel all the honest ones. And what would be my love to the superman, and all that is to come, if I should counsel and speak otherwise? not only to propagate yourselves onwards, but upwards. There too, O oh my brethren, may the garden of marriage help you. 25. He who hath grown wise concerning old origins, lo, he will at last seek after the fountains of the future and new origins. O oh my brethren, not long will it be until new peoples shall arise, and new fountains shall rush down into new depths. For the earthquake, it choketh up many wells, it causeth much languishing, but it bringeth also to new light inner powers and secrets. The earthquake discovereth new fountains, in the earthquake of old peoples new fountains burst forth. And whoever calleth out, Lo, here is a well for many thirsty ones, one heart for many longing ones, one will for many instruments, around him collecteth a people, that is to say, many attempting ones, who can command, 
who must obey. That is there attempted. Ah, with what long seeking and solving, and failing and learning and reattempting. Human society, it is an attempt, so I teach, a long seeking. It seeketh, however, the ruler. An attempt, my brethren, and no contract. Destroy, I pray you, destroy that word of the soft-hearted and the half and half. 26. O my brethren, with whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole of human future? Is it not with the good and just? And those who say and feel in their hearts, We already know what is good and just, we possess it also. Woe to those who still seek it thereafter. And whatever harm the wicked may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. And whatever harm the world maligners may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. O oh, my brethren, into the hearts of the good and just looked some one once on a time, who said, They are the Pharisees. But people did not understand him. The good and just themselves were not free to understand him. Their spirit was imprisoned in their good conscience. Their stupidity of the good is unfathomably wise. It is the truth, however, that the good must be Pharisees. They have no choice. The good must crucify him who deviseth his own virtue. That is the truth. The second one, however, who discovereth their country, the country, heart, and soul of the good and just, it is he who asked, Whom do they hate most? The Creator hate they most. Him who breaketh the tables and old values, the breaker. Him they call the lawbreaker. For the good, they cannot create. They are always the beginning of the end. They crucify him who writeth new values on new tables. They crucify unto themselves the future. They crucify the whole human future. The good, they have always been the beginning of the end. 27. O oh, my brethren, have ye also understood this word? And what I once said of the last man? With whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole human future? Is it not with the good and just? Break up, break up, I pray you, the good and just. O oh, my brethren, have ye understood also this word? 28. Ye flee from me. Ye are frightened? Ye tremble at this word? O oh, my brethren, when I enjoined you to break up the good, and the tables of the good, then only did I embark man on his high seas, and now only cometh unto him the great terror, the great outlook, the great sickness, the great nausea, the great seasickness. False shores and false securities did the good teach you. In the lies of the good were ye born and bred. Everything hath been radically contorted and distorted by the good. But he who discovereth the country of man, discovered also the country of man's future. Now shall ye be sailors for me, brave, patient. Keep yourselves up betimes, my brethren. Learn to keep yourselves up. The sea stormeth. Many seek to raise themselves against you. The sea stormeth. All is in the sea. Well, cheer up, ye all seamen hearts. What of the fatherland? Thither striveth our helm, where our children's land is. Thitherwards, stormier than the sea, stormeth our great longing. 29. Why so hard? said to the diamond one day the charcoal. Are we then not near relatives? Why so soft, O oh my brethren? Thus do I ask you, are you not my brethren? Why so soft, so submissive, and yielding? Why is there so much negation and abnegation in your hearts? 
why is there so little fate in your looks? And if ye will not be fates and inexorable ones, how can ye one day conquer with me? And if your hardness will not glance and cut and chip to pieces, how can ye one day create with me? For the creators are hard, and blessedness must it seem to you to press your hand upon millenniums as upon wax, blessedness to write upon the will of millenniums as upon brass, harder than brass, nobler than brass. Entirely hard is only the noblest. This new table, O oh my brethren, are put over you. Become hard. 30. O oh thou, my will, thou change of every need, my needfulness, preserve me from all small victories. Thou fatest my soul, which I call fate, thou in me, over me, preserve and spare me for one great fate. And thy last greatness, my will, spare it for thy last, that thou mayest be inexorable in thy victory. Ah, who had not succumbed to his victory? Ah, whose eye had not bedimmed in this intoxicating twilight? Ah, whose foot hath not faltered and forgotten in victory? How to stand? That I may one day be ready and ripe for one great noontide, ready and ripe like the glowing ore, the lightning-bearing cloud, the swelling milk udder, ready for myself and for my most hidden will, a bow eager for its arrow, an arrow eager for its star, a star ready and ripe in its noontide, glowing, pierced, blessed by annihilating sun arrows, a sun itself and an inexorable sun will ready for annihilation in victory. O will, thou change of every need, my needfulness, spare me for one great victory. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part three, chapter fifty six, Old and New Tables, read and recorded by Tim Sherman Chase, in April, 2008.